Why, hello there. To receive each episode of Sacred Symbols three days earlier than the public, totally ad-free. To have your questions, comments, and concerns read on the air. To hear your name in the end credits, and to score other cool perks. Please consider supporting this show on Patreon at patreon.com slash Stand. Not only will your subscription net you benefits for Sacred Symbols and allow this show to continue into the future, but those benefits also carry over to other CLS shows too, including the video game-centric YouTube show SideQuest, the retro and nostalgia-themed podcast Knockback, and the eclectic interview series Fireside Chats. In other words, you're getting insane bang for your buck. Again, that's patreon.com slash Stand. Thank you for your kindness, generosity, and support. Without you, Sacred Symbols and CLS couldn't and wouldn't exist. Now, on to the show. Greetings and salutations. Welcome back to Sacred Symbols, a PlayStation podcast. This is episode 10. We somehow made it 10 episodes already. My name Look is at Co- that. My name is Colin Moriarty. I'm joined by my lovely co-host, Chris Reagan. How's it going? How are you? I'm good. I just got back from PAX. How was it? This was your first PAX, right? Yeah, yeah. I've never been to... This is my first year going to these things in general. Like, I didn't... I never really went. I, I guess I went to VidCon last year, but that was it. And how are you enjoying it? Or how did you enjoy it, the show? It was it was nice. It was basic. I mean, it was just basically a smaller E3, is what I noticed. But there were a bunch of stuff. There's there's a bunch of stuff that I saw that I really kind of piqued my interest. I saw Dreams. I didn't get to play it because the line was like weird. What did you think? Well, so did you did you see anyone playing it? Yeah, yeah. I watched uh, for quite a while at some of the different like mini game demo type deals, and I'll say uh, it exists. Yeah. And it, it doesn't look terrible, right. actually. It looks kind of okay. I have no doubt that the game's going to be f- just fine Yeah, in yeah. terms of its production quality. That's will not it, my concern. Yeah, will it be a return <laughs> yeah. is a different story because uh, it's certainly... I wouldn't count it out as a decent game, but, like, ah, man. It's been in development for quite a while for it to be in the, in the state that I saw. Which isn't bad, but, like, not, like, you know, big or grand or anything. I just... It's just confusing. I just don't care about it. <laughs> I just can't bring myself to possibly care about it. I'm rooting for Media Molecule. I think they're nice, very nice people. Yeah. yeah. Did anyone recognize you at the show? We were talking about this. You, a few people, a few sacred symbols. Did anyone tell you that I was handsome at the show? Nobody told me that Colin you know was handsome. Nobody said that. I gave you guys explicit instructions. There's like 50 something thousand of you listening to the show every week right now, like 55,000 <laughs> or 60,000 people. And not one of you told Chris that I was handsome at it's PAX? A, you've, you failed. You Jesus failed Colin. Christ. That's really disappointing. But you had a nice time. Yeah, it was cool. I played played a little bit of Spyro too, and that was fun. Exactly. I'm really happy that they didn't change the controls. As weird as that sounds, because like it like clicked immediately when I got back into it. And I was like, okay, because I was worried they were gonna be like, you sprint with the triggers or something. I was like, I don't want that. No, you don't want. It. Well, it would be cool to, have, I guess, have. I'm sure there's probably like an alternate control scheme that you could probably right. work. That's like a more modern kind of take. But like, I was happy that the demo was, you know, classic without a without a heartbeat. I was like back into it, and I was like, "Oh, I remember how to fly and do that little hop." It's fun. I'm looking forward to playing that myself. I haven't played a Spyro game probably since Enter the Dragonfly. That was what 2002. That's a while ago. So it's, that was, it's very pretty. You know, there's a lot of interesting. There's an interesting provenance with that series that I'm 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 quite fond of, and that they've made Spyro into something that we don't even like Skylanders, which was even bigger than Spyro. That we don't even really correlate with Spyro was always really an interesting marketing thing to me. Yeah, it's really weird that, that that even happened. That confused the hell out of me when it, when that was first like a thing. Yeah, super super interesting. Good for them and good for you. How, did you enjoy Washington? This is the first time you were in Washington State. Yeah, no, it was cool. It was nice. Uh, I was also staying like really close to the concert. Like everything was like considerably convenient. But no, I enjoyed my uh, limited time there. Great, it was cool. Well, welcome back. Yeah, welcome back. For those of you that don't know about Sacred Symbols, if this is your first episode, Sacred Symbols is a PlayStation podcast. We put it up every week to get the show three days early and without ads. You can support the show at patreon.com slash Collins Last Stand. You get other perks by doing that as well, including the ability to submit questions, comments, concerns, thoughts and ideas to the show every week, which we read a bunch of them. And we're going to read a bunch of those today. And, of course, you get exclusive podcasts. And the last exclusive podcast that's already live for all patrons a dollar or up a month is a special episode of Sacred Symbols that will not be released to the public, all about Chris and his gaming taste. We get to know him better, and people are really responding very well to that. You wouldn't know because yeah. you don't have access to my Patreon. <laughs> you know, one of the interesting things that I've been I've been begging Patreon for a while because I have a good relationship with them, and they run a ton of betas on my Patreon to garner data, so we have a nice symbiotic relationship with each other. Right. And one thing I've been asking them, and I was like, can I get an admin login for my brother Dagan and my co-host Chris so that they can 
log in and see what's going on there. And they're like, the app is bad enough. Like, they have a bunch of other technical hiccups yeah, to deal yeah, with. Yeah, <laughs> the app on mobile is, like, horrendous. It's awful. Yeah. It's just an awful thing. Like, I used to do my monthly Q&As by using the app and going through the questions. And then I realized people were complaining I was skipping, like, half the questions because there was a caching problem. Just a lot of things to worry about yeah. over there. But, you know, nonetheless, please support us over at Patreon if you want. If you like the show and all of the perks there also trans... I don't know what... Transmit, I guess? Yeah. To other shows that I do as well. Fireside Chats, Knockback, and SideQuest. Now, Chris... Yeah. There are a few things that we need to clarify and go into before we go any further. Right. The some, first one some, has to do with uh, some corrections, some fuck ups. Yeah. The first one has to do with a Michelin man. Oh, now, God. last week we talked about and someone submitted a question. Would we rather fight and maybe fight to the death with Grimace from McDonald's or the Michelin <laughs> man? And I think we both thought that the Michelin man was far more daunting of a creature and would probably kill us if yeah. we fought him. But we were describing him as being made of cylindrical rings. Is that, not really, what he, is, that, is that not what he is? This really bothered a lot of people because they were like, guys, uh, the cylindrical rings are tires. And I was like, oh, that makes sense. But Michelin Man's white and he's got like white grooves. Yeah. So I'm not entirely convinced. That's also like more terrifying to me that he's a creature made out of inanimate objects. Yes. That technically don't have nerve endings and thus can't feel pain. That's even more. That's worse to me. It is. It, it's horrifying. I, I double down on, on uh, Grimace. Grimace not only feels pain, he likes to feel pain, which is his own sort of <laughs> disturbing thing as well. Chris, I also wanted to follow up on a question. I think it was the last question we read on episode nine at the end of the episode, which came from someone who was asking about, like, where are the religious protagonists right. in games? And we got an interesting piece of feedback on this. Okay. Uh, Jessica G wrote into us and said, on your last podcast, you asked about games featuring religion. Not sure if it was mentioned, but there was a game I played years ago where you played some kind of preacher turned gunslinger, or maybe it was preacher turned bounty hunter called Call of Juarez. You carried around a Bible and you would read verses from the Bible before and after kills. Really? Yeah. That, I, I totally know what you're talking about. Call of Juarez does the protagonist of that series is a preacher. And there you go. I don't know if that's exactly what you're looking for since he's a mass murderer. But yeah, <laughs> you know, nonetheless, I mean, I, I thought of uh, I thought of another one with Dante's Inferno. The guy from Dante's Inferno mm. was also obviously like a like a Templar kind of guy. Yeah, there so, you go. And yeah, yeah I, I guess even if you segue that like Assassin's Creed and stuff like that has a lot of yeah. religious connotations. So I wanted to just follow up on that in case it was bothering anyone. You talked already about you had played Spyro, but uh, you started uh, Shadow of the Tomb Raider yeah. as well. And we both have access to the game. I've not started it yet because I've been busy with Spider-Man. We'll segue into that in a minute and our plan on that game because I don't want to talk too deeply about it until you have played it. But talk to me a little bit about Tomb Raider and we can talk about it in a very general way because the review embargo has not lifted yet. So like more of a preview, like 10,000 foot view of the game so far. Right, right. Well, I'm not that deep into it. I, I Obviously, I was at PAX, so I just uh, I started playing last night. I didn't pull like an all-nighter or anything. But uh, so far, it seems like a far more polished and far more responsive version of what we've had before. It doesn't feel too different. It's not like breaking any molds. I'm liking it so far. And the, honestly, like just like stuff like the options, the, just the pause menu and like the options menu is impressive to me. Yeah, you were talking a little bit about this because I remember seeing a story about this. And I think we're talking about the same thing where it's actually it actually has like a granular difficulty level in terms of like separating combat from puzzle solving from all this kind of stuff. Yeah, right? yeah. There's like a different difficulty slider for exploration, puzzles and combat, which is like super cool. And I, I'm not sure if that's ever been a thing in a game before. I'm sure it probably has, but I've never seen it before. And I was really kind of impressed by that, like right off the bat. Um, there's also like interesting language settings, too, where like you can actually have people in the game speak their native language That's if cool. you want. And I was like, oh, this is kind of... I'm going to do that. Yeah, it's really cool. Yeah. It's like, uh, I don't know. It's just, it's super neat so far. It's not like a reinvention. If, if you didn't like the previous ones, I don't, I don't know. I don't know if it's going to sell you, but I'm enjoying it. I, Chris, have been playing Spider-Man. Oh, yeah, how is it? It's really great. I mean, I, I don't... It's fun. I don't think it's a huge surprise <laughs> that it's great. To catch people up on what our plan is going to be and kind of why we're in this situation, my ideal would have been that we were going to talk about the game this week in depth because the embargo, by the time everyone listens to this, would have been lifted. And you guys can check out my video review on Colin's Last Stand's side quest channel if you want. That'll be up at embargo, and I'll go more in depth into the game there. So here's what ended up happening is that Sony ended up sending me a code, and I've, I've requested multiple times to just try to get Chris into the flow of things, to be like, you know, when you guys think of me, also think of Chris, because this is a team, and we kind of both need access 
So, you know, I've tried. I tried really hard. Hopefully, as I expressed to them, by the time Days Gone comes out in February, which is the next game that we're even going to be discussing with Sony, that we'll both be on the same page, and I suspect we will be. But because I was the only one that was able to play it, I don't want to speak about it too deeply until Chris plays the game because I, A, don't want to spoil it, and I'm super intrigued, especially because Chris is an actual Spider-Man fan and a fan of comics, I guess, more (laughs) deeply than I am, which I am not at all. I would be, I think Chris's perspective is actually even more important than my own. So, first of all, sorry that you haven't played the game yet. (laughs) It's fine. But nonetheless, again, like I said last week, we're not owed anything, so they didn't have to send me the game either. Yeah. It's not like I have like this chip on my shoulder about that. I'm just a little disappointed. I felt bad. you know. And like I told Chris, because of the nature of embargoes, I would have been totally happy to give him my copy of the game if I was able to do that because I just was more intrigued by his opinion, but we were not able to do that. Alas, here here we are. So when we convene on Monday to record episode 11, we'll also record a supplemental episode, maybe an hour long. That's all about Spider-Man. And we'll, it'll be a deep dive kind of spoilery look at things as well as we'll do a spoiler free kind of review at the beginning. So does that sound good to you? Yeah, that sounds fine. Perfect. So just as a preliminary kind of thing, I think the game is great. I think it's super fun to go around like to traverse the city to web sling and do all that kind of stuff. It's super, super fast. I have a few complaints about the game that I think are significant. And one of them is, is that it has the Sonic the Hedgehog syndrome where if you're standing still or trying to do something very exact or very fine, it's like there's no f- way to feather or throttle the controls, really. So if you're moving at a million miles an hour, the game feels great. But if you're trying to just like be calm and collected, it, it feels like Sonic. You feel like an anvil, basically. So <laughs> that's a problem for me. And the other problem that I think is worth noting is that I just feel like it's it's got this combat depth and like lots of moves to do, but you don't have to do any of them, really. Like and, and that's that to me is always a problem. I'm like, why have the, all of this button mapping and all these move this move list if I'm really just smashing square, parrying yeah, yeah, yeah. and then smashing square? Are you are you playing on like is there like a difficulty? Yeah, there is. I'm playing on normal. When I'm reviewing a game, I typically like to try to play on normal. Right, I right. typically play games on hard, as you know, and yeah. I think you do too. When I'm playing for fun, but I don't think that that's a accurate representation of the game. And if I got frustrated because of that, then I don't think that's fair, you know, to the game. So. Mm-hmm. That's kind of where I stand. The the controversial thing, though, Chris, that I think is going to annoy people <laughs> from my perspective is that I think that this is the weakest of the three major PlayStation exclusives this year. The other two being God of War and Detroit. That's not a knock against Spider-Man because they're all universally great games that I, rec- I recommend all three of them, by mm-hmm. the way. All three. You should buy if you haven't played all three of them. You know, it's that will cost you $180 well spent or maybe not even so much anymore because the uh, two of the games are are a little older, but that's kind of my high-end view of Spider-Man. You guys can go look at my review if you want, and again, I want to wait for Chris before we get any deeper into what the game is all about. But yes, I do think Detroit is still the best PlayStation 4 exclusive of the year, and I know that's making a lot of you just <laughs> yeah, scream out. I don't know. I'd put God of War. I think but, God of War is better than Spider-Man, too. Well, yeah, yeah. I I, I had no... I, I don't know. It's a, it's a superhero game, so you kind of have to expect that this is going to be fun, but it's not going to... Like, God of War surprised me, you know? I don't anticipate Spider-Man's going to... I, I anticipate I'm going to get a very fun Spider-Man game, and I probably will. You absolutely will. Yeah. And what I like about it, Chris, more than anything, and we can definitely go into this next week, it doesn't overstay its welcome. That's I good. Think, I, I think like you that. can do all of it in 25 hours. You can platinum the whole game and be done in 25 hours. And with the DLC coming very quickly in October, you know, not too long before you play again. We're so. going to talk a little bit about that. We will. But Chris, before we go any further, we did get a few questions in regard to Spider-Man that I wanted to address in now, because it's not so much about the final product... Be, you know, through the lens of playing the final product, because the people that are bitching about this have not played the game. Right. But we got a few questions in regard to this controversy that's going around. And I don't know if you've seen this, but I want to read at least a couple of these out. Antonio Pereira wrote into us and said, hey, Colin and Chris, with all the controversy surrounding Spider-Man PS4's supposedly downgraded graphics, what are your opinions on the whole situation? Personally, it seems like a whole lot of nothing. The game still looks great, and it isn't like the whole Watch Dogs 1 situation where it was really obvious. Love the show and keep up the good work, guys. And before I go any further, I want to read one more because I think we can talk about this in totality. Yeah. Sergio DeVivo wrote in and said, hey, guys, tough question here. I know you can't talk about Spider-Man until embargo is up. Well, we can because the embargo is up by the time you're hearing this. But I really wanted to ask you about Puddlegate. Is it so bad for people to voice their opinions and worry about the change in quality from an E3 trailer to the final release of a video game? I mean, there are some images that might look like a dip in quality. But checking Twitter, the gaming media treats us like we're entitled idiots. Why do prominent names in the gaming media feel the need to insult people who voice their opinions on the topic? Don't they know we're their audience? So this is two questions coming from totally different perspectives yeah. about the same thing. What do you make of this? For people that don't know, there's images going around where puddles have been removed and there seems to be a graphical downgrade in some parts of Spider-Man. I don't know enough about that to be able to confirm or deny that. I think the game looks stunning at, at times. And other right. times I think it looks pretty pedestrian, to be honest. Mm-hmm. So what do you make of this? Do you think this is a big deal? 
Uh, not really. It doesn't seem like it's affected the game all that much at all. I, I, it's funny because I've seen a lot of uh, I've seen a lot of these graphics comparisons, but they're all in GIFs, which is weird. Yeah, because it's, uh, it's like this like 280p yeah. thing, and it's like ah, oh, this this looks worse, and it's like well, you, this this all all of this looks bad. As far as it goes with people, you know, uh, talking down to people, I th- I think that's kind of annoying. But I think the complaints about it are a bit overblown. It doesn't seem like it's that big of a deal. And but we, and we were talking about this last time about the CD Projekt Red. Is like you you were like, hey, why are they talking about how this is a not a finished product? You know. There you go. <laughs> and I this is why. Wrong. Yeah. This is why. <laughs> this is exactly why. But like, well, it's, that's very well said because I didn't expect an illustration so vivid. I guess. Christian Larson wrote into us and said, dudes, this Spider-Man controversy over downgrading is baffling to me. It makes me think back to The Division, which didn't bother me but caused an internet uproar. It also compares directly with CD Projekt Red's trepidation about releasing the E3 private yeah. gameplay demo of Cyberpunk 2077 with them releasing a video containing a legal disclaimer so some dimwit doesn't sue. I love seeing still shots of a work in progress or a product made for marketing purposes, even if it isn't a proper depiction of the end product. It gets me pumped for the game, which is what gamers thrive on. Where is the fine line between releasing details, photos, and videos of a game well in advance of release to boost awareness and excitement versus misinforming gamers about the end product? Cheers to you both. So this is exactly what Chris said, and I wanted to read Christian's question before I answered myself because I think there is a legitimate concern, I think, about showing too much too Mm -hmm. soon. But I really feel like developers are often showing too much too soon, too often, regardless of if the game is embroiled in controversy at the end or not. I don't understand why we even saw Spider-Man in 2016 at all. Yeah. And I know that they were aiming for a 2017 release, and then it got obviously booted to deep 2018. So the game, somewhere along the lines, I don't want to say the game was in trouble because I don't know that at all, but somewhere along the lines in reading about it where Marvel was confirming the game was supposed to come out last year, and then it took all this time to come out, something changed. And... That's why it's, you know, it happens in movies too when you see trailers and there are scenes in trailers all the time that are not in the movie. And you can, you guys can go on IMDb and look at that. It's pretty common. So I understand people's concern, and but you have to understand that making a game is dynamic. And they made a vertical slice of the game, for instance, this combat scene with the puddles on the ground and stuff like that. And it probably ran fine and they were probably proud of it. And when they stitched everything together, they realized that the, the frame rate was probably dipping or there was some texture problems or resolution problems. And they were like, we can't, lock the frame rate, for instance, at 30 frames and have these things here because it's it's too taxing on the console and we're stripping it out. And wouldn't you want them to make that decision? That's kind of my take. Is like, I understand that you're all upset about this, but shit changes. And I guarantee you that that scene with that puddle was not in the full game. <laughs> and when it was and they had to deal with all the other processing problems and all the kind of stuff that's going on when a game is is actually running, they probably were like, we have to make concessions. It happens. Yeah, these sacrifices are usually done for, uh, and I say usually, with like a big asterisk, usually for the greater good of the product. There's too much importance placed on graphics, I think. I, I think, first and foremost, a game needs to be fun. It needs to run well. In Tomb Raider, there's a, and, and in God of War as well, there's a performance mode, and there is a resolution mode, where it's like, hey, you can, you can have a pretty game to look at, but it's not going to be as steady. Or you can choose a steady game that doesn't look as, as fantastic. Always. I always choose the frame rate, you know? I don't know why you would want a game to like, oh, these puddles look really nice in, in 24 frames per second, you know? Eh. Yeah, it's it's strange know. to me. I'm not one of these savants that like understand, like look at a game and be like, this is running at 27 frames a second. Like I've known people like that that I'm like, how do you possibly know that? Oh, I can tell when, I, when, I can't. when something's dipping below 30. Oh, I can tell. I, what I've always said is I can tell if a game is running at 60. I can tell if a game is running well or normally. I can tell if a game is dipping or, or sluggish. Yeah. But I could never identify. I know people that are like, that is running at 22 frames. Yeah. I'm like, I don't understand how you can possibly know that. And then you bring up the indicator and it's like totally right. Are they like editors? Yeah. like or Yeah, people that work in the <laughs> industry. People that, yeah, people that I, yeah, people that just understand video way more than I do. I am not one of these graphics whores. Not that there's anything wrong with that where... I need a game to run at 4K at 60 frames a second. Spider-Man, you know, I didn't even know that... Sp- I thought Spider-Man ran at 60 frames, but it doesn't. And even on PS4 Pro, it doesn't. But looking at it, I'm like, this. the game looks incredibly fluid. They do it by motion blur and stuff like that to make it look good. So they didn't make these incredible sacrifices like you're saying. And Tomb Raider obviously forces you to make one sacrifice or the other if you're playing in performance mode. So I think it's much, much ado about nothing. I understand people's concerns, but I also think people have to be a little more understanding that the dynamic nature of video game development means things must change. And, you know, you always hear development stories about how games start big and they end up small. Or they start big and they end up smaller anyway. That's just the way it is. Yeah. There are situations in the industry that I think call for, like, if you're 
if you're talking down to an audience, that's probably not the best idea. But I think this, I don't know, I'm not concerned about it. And it doesn't seem like it's affected how good the game is in any way. So I'm just, yeah, I'm just kind of excited to play it. I'm excited for you to play it too. And I can categorically say one more time, regardless of this so-called downgrade controversy, I highly recommend you play Spider-Man. It's a great game. And we'll have more about that next week. Should we get into the news? Yeah. Let's do it. There are only, I think, 10 or 11 items this week. We can probably blaze through these pretty quick. And I've put a nice smorgasbord, a nice collection of questions in here as well from the audience. And again, you can support us at patreon.com slash Collins Last Stand if you want to submit those questions, comments, concerns, thoughts, and ideas. All right, let's do it. Number one, there's some news to report about last week's horrendous shooting at a Madden tournament hosted by Electronic Arts in Jacksonville, Florida. For starters, EA has canceled the remaining qualifier events that the Jacksonville event was a part of out of respect for those who died. Additionally, EA is creating something called the Jacksonville Tribute, which is a fund for the victims and the victims' families. EA is throwing a million dollars into the fund. There will also be a so-called Jacksonville Tribute live stream on September 6th, which may have already passed, depending on when you are listening to this. And finally, according to The Hollywood Reporter, a victim of the shooting, Jacob Midditch, who was shot twice by the gunman, has filed a lawsuit against the bar that hosted the event in Jacksonville, EA, and other entities. And we got a question about this from Jorge Palomino, who says, hey guys, excellent work. In the aftermath of the shooting in Jacksonville, it seems one of the survivors is suing EA and the venue. While I sympathize with the victim because of his injuries, I feel it's unfair to sue the venue because this could because they could not foresee this happening. What are your thoughts? And how will this lawsuit affect further comp- competitions in the future? Thanks, as always. What is it, the security that they're suing about? Presumably. And I actually completely disagree with Jorge, Chris, because I don't think he should probably be suing EA. Maybe EA is culpable. I'm no legal expert, in, in case you guys didn't know. But... The culpability seems to be closest to the event, which is the people that staged the event and should have bouncers and security. But EA did pay for it. I'm totally sympathetic with this lawsuit. I, I think you absolutely have every if if I went to a fucking video game competition and got shot twice by someone because of the negligence of the companies that did it, I would absolutely sue you into the ground. So, yeah, no, <laughs> you know, I don't really disagree either. <laughs> I think things are getting a little too sue happy in general. There's a lot of lawsuits, a lot of ridiculous, frivolous lawsuits happening that I just can't believe. This is, a, <laughs> I think, a cut above. You know, well, once there's like bullets flying around, I think it's like, ah, maybe. Yeah, if you could, if EA or this bar or other entities could have stopped this by having a metal detector or a proper security or better right, planning, yeah. then that's absolutely makes them culpable for this event. And, you know, even though Florida has very loose gun laws, which is fine, I have no problem with that. You know, you have to know that there are bad actors out there. And the silver lining of this terrible event to me if you could call it a silver lining, I don't mean to diminish it at all, and I think you guys know that, is that I don't feel like we're going to necessarily see something like this happen again at a gaming event because there are going to be people paying much closer attention to these dangers now. And, and in a lot of ways, it's remarkable that something like this has never happened or it doesn't. I'm always it. shocked whenever I go to like, um, I mean, I guess it's just the culture that we're in that I'm, I'm kind of like paranoid about this kind of thing happening like all the time at like, especially at big uh, meetups and events and stuff like that. When I went to... E3, the security was actually pretty pretty intense at E3 compared to PAX, which is like... Really? Well, yeah, when I went to PAX, I was like, this is a little concerning. <laughs> a lot you of, just walked in there. It's a know? lot of trust, right? It is a lot of trust. Uh, and it is it is kind of astounding that nothing bad has happened until now. I always think about that on the highway. On like, the highway? Yeah, about trust. About right, oh yeah. How there's like, you know, around you, there's 40 cars and some motorcycles. And at any one time, anyone can just jerk the wheel and fuck anyone over. And, yeah. and like, obviously, they would hurt themselves and kill themselves. But to, to the point, the gunman, obviously, this was a suicide attempt, I, I guess, on his part. He killed himself. So Jesus. I guess what I'm saying is like you are always in these situations where, where horrible things can happen. And it's just a trust issue. And it is amazing. Like, I don't know what E3 is like anymore. You said the security was pretty good there. I've been to, I think, 11 or 10 E3s. I don't think I walked through one metal detector ever there, and I don't think I was ever frisked going to E3 in my life. Mm. They are more concerned about looking at your ID than or your like your badge. Yeah, they had they had detectors when I went. That's good. Um, which is like good. A, which, which, or at least I think they were detect. They looked like detectors. <laughs> you had to walk through a big thing. But um, yeah, compared to like VidCon or like PAX, it's, it's a night and day. You don't want to surrender your freedom i guess to and i'm not getting political at all i don't mean it like that i you don't want to surrender your freedom to enjoy yourself and go into these situations carefree and willing to have fun and, and kind of excited and i feel like the militarizing these things is going to be like over emphasizing the danger but i think that there probably needs to be more in there so again the silver lining of this hopefully is that it wakes publishers and developers and stakeholders like the esa and everyone up 
that we got to be a little bit safer. So again, we wish our best to the victims. I think EA donating a million dollars is a huge stand-up move by them. I also know that they're probably afraid of getting sued, and I I assume that everyone there is going to sue them. So <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> and they're going to be settling quite a bit of money. We'll see. Number two. Sony has put its foot even further in its mouth regarding the lack of crossplay between PS4 and other manufacturers' hardware. According to The Independent, Sony CEO Kenichiro Yoshida told Berlin, Germany's IFA technology show, quote, On cross-platform, our way of thinking is always that PlayStation is the best place to play. Fortnite, I believe, partnered with PlayStation 4, is the best experience for users. That's our belief. But actually, we already opened up some games as cross-platform with PC and some others, so we decided based on what is the best user experience. This is our way of thinking cross-platform, end quote. Now, we got a question from Tyler Franklin who says, As a multi-platform gamer already, I don't have too much interest in cross-play integration. However, Sony's recent remarks regarding the matter are certainly making it harder to respect their position. The claim that PlayStation is better, therefore we don't need cross-play, seems like a culmination of arrogance that I have a hard time imagining core gamers will respect. I don't feel PlayStation is personally the best platform, especially in regards with online play, and the remark seems painfully corporate and nonsensical. Does this arrogance hint at a dark future for upcoming hardware? I don't think this crossplay situation is a situation. I don't. I don't think it really matters. But when you respond like this, you make it matter. Yeah, it's definitely it's definitely like pouring uh, pouring gas on a spark. They're really understating the importance of this kind of feature in the future. I, I understand crossplay is not a big thing right now because not a lot of people have picked it up. But I think people have to understand that when you have crossplay enabled, especially on games that are on multiple platforms. You allow a game that otherwise might not have a healthy install base to have a very healthy install base. Imagine you have an underrated multiplayer game that has no chance at competing fairly with uh, Fortnite or, or any of these other games. If you allow crossplay in that title or on your platforms, you allow a game to at least have a, a far better or a far healthier player base than it otherwise would. It just seems like a positive thing, and I don't know why, I don't know why they're so up in arms against it. It just, it's so weird to me. People were sending me stories to, I don't know if it's uh, the veracity of the stories that like shit like crossplay, it was like accidentally turned on at some point and then turned back off. Like oh, there, there was like know. a moment, like it's that easy where right. it's just like flipping some switches. Like the games should integrate with each other. They're on the same engine and the architecture is much more open now. And it's not like cell processing anymore and stuff like that, where the games might not function together. I don't feel like this crossplay situation is relevant to almost anyone. But again, I also feel like you have to just ignore it. Yeah, you can't like you can't make a big statement about it if you don't really care about it. Right. If you don't want to do it, I suppose that's your prerogative as a corporation and you guys have your own reasoning and I'm sure that the reasoning might be sound and you might not be able to tell us. But just ignore it. People are getting tired of hearing about the story and I'm only reporting on it because it was reported on, but I don't feel like it's relevant and I feel like Sony would be wise to just shut up now and and to the question that was submitted to us yeah, I do think, and I've said this before, there's no reason to be confident Sony's going to figure PS5 out the way they figured PS4 out. And little things like this are canaries in the coal mine. They just are. You know, if they had better PR planning, this is their CEO. <laughs> this isn't like some dude that misspoke yeah. somewhere at a, at a trade show or something like that. He was in front of a huge audience at a big show, IFA in Berlin, and he said it. It's very boastful, and it's, it's, very, um, it's very cocky. Yes. Number three, Sony, Insomniac Games, and Marvel have big plans for PS4 Spider-Man after it launches. All was explained by Insomniac's James Stevenson on the PlayStation blog. The DLC pack is collectively called The City That Never Sleeps, and it's rolling out in three waves. On October 23rd, the heist launches, which revolves around Black Hat. In November and December, Turf Wars and Silver Lining follows, though we, will have, though we have little information on those as of now. You can buy the entire DLC bundle for $24.99, or you can spend $9.99 on each of them as they roll out. And Andrew Thompson wrote into us about this, and he said, Hello, Colin and Chris. It was announced this week that Spider-Man will be getting DLC coming in October to be rolled out through the end of Q4, which upset some people due to the optics of announcing more paid content before the game's launch. As a consumer and a completionist, this announcement has the feel of simply increasing the price of the full game. I recognize the alternative to this is the same DLC announced in October, and also know that players move on from even great games after time and before the DLC. But this leaves a bad taste in my mouth and makes me less willing to commit to the game. Do you think the backlash to this practice is fair? And what would the ideal solution for developers and consumers alike be? Thanks for everything. Do you think it's a big deal that they announced not only the DLC, but the DLC rollout plan before the game even launched? I think when you have a game that's not even out yet, especially one that's been so heavily marketed, 
<laughs> like Spider-Man has, I think you're better off just kind of waiting. At, give it at least like a week. You know, if the game's complete and it's finished and people are satisfied with it, then people aren't going to complain about more DLC. And I think, you know, I'm sure some people will. But the thing to me is that with this, with this in particular, I haven't played the game yet. And I've seen so much in marketing. And now I know just based off some of the headlines on articles written about this thing. that like, hey, Black Cat debuts in, in, in uh, Spider-Man DLC. And it's like, oh, okay, so now I know that Black Cat is in the, in the, it, it, she's not in the main game. So now I know something about the game that I didn't need to know. And it's just like, we need to maybe calm down a little bit. I understand that day one DLC is like a bad thing for most. It's, a, it's like a bad red flag for most things, but... This just like frustrates me a little bit. I said something similar at E3 about The Division 2 when on the stage they were like, by the way, we're rolling out three pieces of DLC in the first year of the game. I'm like, the game doesn't come out for fucking 10 months. <laughs> you know, a lot of people were like, well, they're showing the fact that they're going to support it long term. And I'm like, That's but good. of course they are. Like, what are you, what are you insane? You, yeah. I don't need them to tell me that on the, on the stage of E3. Oh, The Division's going to come out and the sequel to The Division's going to come out and they're going to support it with DLC. you got to be kidding me. I can't believe that. Yeah. You know, so I'm of the I'm of the same mind as you, Chris, where I understand why this is unsavory to people to be like looking beyond the game now behind the scenes with PR and marketing, and obviously with development. But a player has every right to be mad that an entity, whether the developer or the publisher or whatever, are looking beyond the launch of a game that isn't even out yet to talk about how they can grab more money from you. And I have no doubt that this DLC is going to be fun, just like the main game. And I'm sure a lot of people are going to enjoy it. And I am not one of these guys that says, like, this could have been in the main game. The main game is, the I just said, the perfect length. I think that's the thing. It's like, if it's a complete thing, you know, I don't mind, like, having extra stuff. Even even if it's, like, really close to release. Um, and I think, honestly, with games like Fortnite and, like, these, uh, you know, Destiny, these things that have new content coming out pretty regularly, I think it's actually a cool thing that we have a single-player game that's kind of following that model where they're giving us new stuff pretty soon afterwards to make sure that, you know, we, we have a healthy stream of content. That's kind of new, I think. Uh, for single player uh, AAA, in uh, or at least as far as I've seen, um, and that's cool. It's just for me, it's this specific game that I've just seen so much about, and now I've had something spoiled by a DLC for a game that's not out yet. And it's, it's like, come on, it's yeah. this specific one really that just like kind of irks me. Yeah, it's it's frustrating. It's a never ending battle about how to balance these things. Obviously, Sony and Marvel. And Insomniac are going to be keen on recovering their money and recouping their money. I have never seen a marketing blitz for a PlayStation game like I've seen with this. Yeah, never. it's intense. Never. It's ridiculous. You see that subway in Manhattan? Yeah. <laughs> I've never seen it. Even with Sony's third-party things with Call of Duty and Destiny and stuff, I've never seen anything like this. Yeah. So they're dumping tons of money, and I would love to see their back-end metrics in terms of how much this game needs to sell to even break even. And I, I bet you it's a lot. And I'm sure they're going to break even. I would be shocked if the sequel wasn't already greenlit and maybe under pre-production and maybe it'll be a PS5 game. And that's the other thing that I want to throw in with this and we can talk about it on next week's podcast is this game begs for a sequel not only through the the story but through the little things that it gets wrong that it can easily get right. And mm. then you're going to have a really fantastic game on your hands as opposed to a great game. So that's that. Luke Ashmore wrote into us and said, hey guys, what do you think about Insomniac releasing the first round of DLC for Spider-Man on October 23rd? I feel like some studios can't seem to hit the sweet spot with their DLC releases. It looks like Insomniac is jumping the gun with this release. And last year, I felt that Guerrilla Games dropped the Frozen Wilds much too late. When is the ideal time to release DLC after a game's launch? Keep up the awesome work. <sighs> that's a good question. I, I, I don't know the sweet spot. Do you, does anybody know the sweet spot? I think that's why there's so many missed uh, so many missed marks is that nobody really knows the sweet spot. I don't know. I think a game like this could be could do fine if they just waited a week. To be honest, it, I would be enthralled if I finished a game, if I got Spider Man the day it was coming out. I finished it within that week, and I probably most people will probably. Um, and then I found out that there's new stuff coming like real soon. That's great, but like let the game come out. Yeah, let it breathe a little bit. I think that he makes two great examples, though, because I think Spider-Man's preemptive and too soon, and I think mm -hmm. for sure Horizon, the DLC was way too late for that game. I think that it would have been ideal to release that a few months at the most after Horizon came out, and I understand that that probably was not possible. Right. I know, you know, in talking to people that this DLC has been in development for a while, so it's not like they just, like, came up with this two months ago. There are people that have been working on this for a long time. That's why it's ready to go. I don't know that Guerrilla or Sony were as organized with Horizon, and I'm not even sure that they knew how well the game was going to do for them to demand this reskin, basically, 
with snow and all that kind of stuff. So it took a little bit more time. So again, we were talking earlier about the, the development cycle and the dynamic nature of development. I think this kind of plays into it as well, but certainly this is a money grab. I don't necessarily begrudge them the money grab because of the amount of money they're spending. But again, I think Chris is absolutely right. If they just literally announce this a little bit later, it's a distraction. Yeah. Like why distract from the game? No and, one cares and, about. And, and people should know how people feel about day one DLC already. Like they, they should. Pe- I feel like developers should know, or the industry uh, people should know that this is like not the best. <laughs> it doesn't have the best image. Yeah, not the best practice, minds. as it were. Yeah. Number four. This month's PlayStation Plus games have been revealed. As always, if you have an active PS Plus account, you can go into the PlayStation Store and secure the following titles free of charge. Remember that even if you don't want to play them now, you can mark them as acquired in the store so you can download them later for free so long as your PS Plus account remains active. On PlayStation 4, Destiny 2 is completely free, as is God of War 3 Remastered. On PS3, you can get completely overrated retro puzzle side-scroller Another World 20th Anniversary Edition. Overrated? I hate that fucking game. We could talk about that. Do you like Another World? I kind of like it. All right, we're going to talk about that in a minute. Which also works on Vita and Cube Director's Cut, which also works on PS4. For Vita, you can get Puzzler Sparkle 2, which also works on PS3 and PS4, and Awesome Beat-Em-Up Foul Play, which also works on PS4. Highly, highly recommend Foul Play. Foul Play is fucking great. It's a great game. It's a brawler, a side-scrolling brawler, not unlike your Double Dragons and your Final Fights, but it takes place on a stage in front of an audience, and their reaction to how well you're doing is your health. So... If you're like doing really impressive moves, then they start cheering and getting up and stuff, and like you're like getting more and more powerful. But if you get hit, then you lose that momentum. And if you start doing shitty moves or repetitive moves, then they start booing you and stuff like that. Oh, that's kind of cool. It's awesome. I played it on Vita, front to back. Great game. I played it maybe in 2016. Niall Prendergast, which isn't a real name, wrote into <laughs> us and said, Hey guys, Destiny 2 is on PS Plus this month. After a terrible reception from the general gaming community after being burnt on the original and somewhat money grabbing DLC. I just want to jump in here. Destiny 2 was not terribly received by the entire gaming community. That's not true. I know it's fun to hate on Destiny 2, but there's plenty of millions of people that play the game. Do you think this is just a, a last a last ditch effort to do something with the game? It was in the plan all along to release on PS Plus at this point. He's asking if it was always in the plan. A very smart marketing effort to increase install base for the DLC or a way to boast huge player numbers to generate investment. Like to hear your thoughts. I was surprised to see Destiny 2 as the free game because it does seem like a mea culpa in a way. To yeah. just give away the game for free. But they also have DLC coming. What do you make of that? Because I did feel like this is a big game to be free. Yeah, yeah. Destiny is uh, my favorite game to hate and root for. I, I, I do think it's it's more or less to boost the install base for the DLC. Because the DLC actually does look kind of cool. And um, their DLCs lately have not. <laughs> and they need a, as big a pool as they can get. It is definitely strange to see it on, on PS Plus. But I think it's I think it's a smart strategy, honestly. I do too. I think it's interesting to Niall's question, which I think is important to state because he was saying like, do they want to drum up investment? Bungie and Activision are the last two entities in the world that need investment. Yeah. What they're trying to do is to see if there's even a demand maybe to continue this series. Bungie is going to be fine. Even if they don't work with Activision and they work with someone else in the future, you know, they'll be perfectly fine. And Activision is one of the biggest publishers in the world. And I'm, I'm pretty sure they probably still made a profit on Destiny too. Oh uh, yeah. 100%. I think that they just want to, see what's going on so i thought you know it was an interesting thing was it always in the plan to make it free possibly maybe if there were certain metrics that weren't met again activision bungie and sony have been in bed together with destiny since the very beginning that was a huge get and an unusual get as people will remember because microsoft always dominated that they're on our stage we get the dlc first we get all the special treatment and that was sony's first coup on ps4 as those of you who have been with us since the beginning might remember so that might have been in the in the fine print somewhere. If Destiny 2 doesn't hit this milestone, we'll make it free on PS Plus. But also remember, Sony pays lots of money for free PS Plus games commensurate to how big that game is. And to make Destiny 2 free is going to require a large sum of money as opposed to the five and sometimes six figures that go out to other developers for making their games free. Number five, Animusha Warlords, one of PlayStation 2's first excellent games that originally launched in 2001, is finally, finally, Getting re-released. I bet you're pumped for this. Dude, we just talked about this. Yeah, I know, right? Like, last, the last episode we did. And this news, by the way, came out, like, right when the episode 9 went out. So, this is an old <laughs> piece of news. Capcom revealed the game will launch on PS4 and elsewhere on January 15th, 2019, at a cost of $19.99. As it was a PS2 game, Animusha came out in standard definition in 4.3, but the re-release has HD graphics and 16.9 support. 
The game also controlled a bit archaically using the D-pad, but now you can use the analog sticks. And of course, the game will have trophies. Animusha last saw the light of day on console in 2006 when Dawn of Dreams came to PS2. I was a junior in college. I remember playing it. That was a long time ago. Jeez. By the time Animusha Warlords comes to PS4, it will have been nearly 13 years since we had a new Animusha game to gush over. And this isn't really even technically a new Animusha game, but maybe a testbed for new Animusha games in the future. Yeah. Cole Bullis wrote into us and said, Animusha Remaster. I can't count how many times I've heard you, Colin, mention Animusha in podcasts and videos over the years. So are you excited for this game, this week's news about the Animusha Remaster? Or would you have preferred Capcom announce a new game in the series? Or maybe Capcom is testing the waters for the franchise through the remaster. I think it's just that. And remember, there's no reason for them to rush. Resident Evil Remaster came out in... Which was re- the GameCube remake remade for PS4 came out, I think in something like 2015 and Resident Evil 2 remaster or remake isn't coming out till next year. So they're not pushing and rushing these games out, but I think testing the waters with Animusha is a very smart thing because I was always surprised that they never went back to the well with this series. It was a really, really great game. Was it like a big game though? Like what did it like sell a bunch? Probably not. Uh, yeah, I would say I remember seeing the sales figures for this recently. Cause Capcom does really sell like historic sales figures. No, it didn't sell great. It sold well enough to get two sequels on PS2 or three sequels on PS2. Yeah. But that was a different time. Games were cheaper to make. People played them quicker. But Animusha was such a memorable experience. I'm really excited that people are going to get to experience this. A lot of people for the first time. And and we'll obviously talk a great deal about that. When the time comes, I'll be all over. I'll bo- I'm bothering Capcom more recently about Mega Man. Once we get through that, I'll start bothering them about, <laughs> about Animusha. As an Essa wrote in and said, With the announcement of Animusha Warlords for the current-gen consoles and no information whatsoever about reviewing the tank control scheme, do you guys believe that these classics should be left alone as their time has passed a long time ago? Or at least remake them like Shadow of the Colossus and Resident Evil with modern control schemes and better texture? I don't know that you're necessarily right, Azam, because they say that they're putting control on the analog sticks as opposed to the D-pad, which indicates to me that it probably will still be tanky, but what I'm saying is, because I don't think they can really fix that, but I think you'll be surprised that the control scheme will probably be a little bit more fluid. Mm. games don't control like that anymore that's true (laughs) we'll see what happens number six upcoming bioware multiplayer third person shooter anthem which is set to launch on february 21st 2019 is getting a demo shortly before the game launches the studio revealed at pax west that the demo will come to ps4 and other platforms on february 1st just 20 days before the game comes out the demo will only be available for ea access and origin access members according to ign as well as anyone who pre-orders the game The studio also confirmed that alphas and betas will roll out before the demo, though they will be closed and likely invite only. Additionally, Bioware revealed at PAX West, courtesy of Game Rant, that all Anthem story-related DLC will be completely free for all. That's good. Yeah, that's a DLC announcement that I can get behind. Very vague. Yeah. And that's good enough for me. So what do you make of this? I think it's very obviously EA trying to not (laughs) be in the bad graces of uh, the general public anymore because they've had so many slip-ups over the last, like, several years. That I think they needed, uh, I guess, uh, Bioware, a new Bioware title would be a good place to kind of try and turn over this new leaf. Uh, <laughs> because they've, they've had a bit of a rough one. They've had a bit of a rough one. They did, and we'll talk about EA just momentarily. I think that we're going to see an interesting new race to the bottom in these persistent shooter worlds. Because if there are A, B, C, and D, four publishers, and... A, B, and C are publishing games from developers that have free DLC, and D is charging for DLC, then surely they're going to lose. Mm-hmm. I, I feel like that's obvious. So I, I'm a little concerned about the erosion of quality or the erosion of a willingness to pay for what you play. Free-to-play, there's nothing wrong with, I don't feel like, but I do think it's it's corrosive to our industry. Right. And I think Do you, have- think, do you think we're going to have, like, bad... <laughs> like, the Anthem DLC is going to be, like, a bit underdone? Maybe it might be undercooked, but you have to look at it through the lens of if you're not paying for it, then what does it matter? I mean, that's that's kind of my concern is yeah. if if anyone complains about that free DLC, I'll be like, that's totally fine from a time spent standpoint, but you didn't pay for it. What do you expect? And since everyone bitches about how everything, how much everything costs all the time, even though games are cheaper than they've ever been straight up way cheaper than they've ever been in real money, you get what you fucking pay for. You literally get what you pay for or you don't. And I think EA is doing this with Bioware because I real I think they realize that this scene is going to be so competitive and so, yeah. so flooded. We were talking about with Ubisoft before announcing the DLC plans and all that kind of stuff. You have to just be preemptive and, and encourage people to say like, I'm going to play Anthem. I'm gonna, I don't know that you can play Anthem and play the division. I just no, don't know how not. you're going to do They're that. They're definitely like directly competing. Yeah. So, um, yeah, we'll see. We were talking about EA's fuck up. So here we go. Number seven. There's a bit to talk about with battlefield five this week. For starters, the game has been delayed. 
Originally slated to come out on October 19th, EA has wisely opted to punt for a month and will now bring the game out on, on November 20th, right before Thanksgiving and Black Friday. Oscar Gabrielson, developer, uh, developer DICE's GM, wrote in the blog post about the move, noting that players' feedback both reinforced the team's belief that they are on the right track, but that they need just a few more weeks to get the best out of the product. The game's open beta is still slotted to begin nearly on time, though. Originally scheduled to roll out on September 4th and 5th, the open beta will now begin on September 6th. Call of Duty Black Ops 4 launches on October 12th, and Red Dead Redemption launches on October 26th, which certainly in no way played into EA's and DICE's decision to, <laughs> to delay the game, I'm sure. It's so obvious. Yeah, it's... It was that very transparent. Yeah. Lucas Maliniak wrote in and said, Loving the show and all the insights you both bring. Keep up the amazing work. Thank you, Lucas. With the Battlefield 5 release date moving, I realized how crazy the lineup is for the fall, as RDR 2 and Fallout 76 both released in the season. Furthermore, the winter lineup for games, January through March, is pretty bulky as well. It's a good time for gamers, but a, t a bad time for publishers and developers, I'd imagine. Like you said, there will be winners and there will be losers. This is the week that floodgates open. Dragon Quest XI, Spider-Man, Destiny 2, Forsaken, etc. This begins a very exciting chapter for Sacred Symbols. So my question is this. How are you How are you feeling about the impending avalanche of games that will be arriving over the next six months? Are you excited? Overwhelmed? I know you won't be able to cover everything, but I know you'll do an awesome job in what you do cover. Thanks for all the hard work and also good job on the editing, Colin. I know it's something you put a lot of time into, and as someone who has done it myself, you do an excellent job. Thank you very much. Appreciation for editors. It's good. Yeah, I edit every episode of Sacred Symbols. I'm whittling down like off like 15 minutes of off of every episode just by proxy of like, you know, getting rid of ums and ahs as much as I can and kind of trash and also things that are just redundant. My stance on that, Chris, is that if you're going to require if you're asking for someone for two hours of their time, you should probably put out the best product you can possibly. Yeah, get. no, absolutely. So I sit here all fucking day editing Sacred Symbols when it's done, but it's totally it's totally a labor of love and I have no problem doing that. So I'm really happy to hear that that's resonating with you, Lucas. Chris, how are you feeling about these next six months? I will say. I am super overwhelmed and I'm not, I'm trying to not even think I'm trying to take it one game at a time. Like we got to, you know, Spider-Man is through, we get, we have Tomb Raider. I'm talking to Ubisoft to get us Assassin's Creed and then we'll have to deal with probably Red Dead and then Fallout and then the little things like Animusha and Resident Evil are coming out, but then you have Sekiro. Mm -hmm. and it's a lot. Anthem. It's and a lot. The it's, Division it's, 2. It's, it's overwhelming as yeah. hell, honestly. What do you think of this? Are you excited? I'm excited, but I'm like, it is overwhelming. Like I'm like, oh my god, how am I, gonna, <laughs> how am I gonna play? Especially because a lot of these games are big. Like Red Dead Redemption Two is not gonna be like a, that's not gonna be a short game. <laughs> no, certainly not. And I it, hope not, considering how long it took. It took no, them. exactly. Yeah, exactly. So uh, <laughs> I don't know, man. It, it's definitely gonna be a, a tricky thing to maneuver around, especially with all the time that I put into like videos and. Oh god, it's a good time for gamers, but it's also like, is it? <laughs> because there's so much. That it's almost like, like you said, someone's got to lose. We lose too by not being able to experience everything. Yeah, and yeah, yeah I don't know. I, I think this, this move by Battlefield Five, I don't know if it's gonna help it really. I don't think so either. It seems to have a lot of bad buzz, poor pre-order numbers. Again, I think people are conflating why those numbers are poor. I think that things are just way too competitive. Yeah. I think Call of Duty's gonna eat shit too. I don't know that you know Activision's gonna be thrilled with how Call of Duty does. I could be totally wrong about that, but. If you're doing a Battle Royale Call of Duty game, well, there's already two very popular Battle Royale games, and maybe people will be interested in trying yours out, but hey, uh, those games are free, you know, particularly Fortnite, which is dominating, so I just think you're going to, I really think it's going to be some bloodbath, man, the last the next six months. I think there's going to be some surprising losers in there as well, and I think Call of Duty and Battlefield will be two of those losers, comparable to how well they usually do. I'm yeah. not saying that no, they're still Call of Duty is going to sell... Rake, they're yeah. raking in millions. I'm not going to say Call of Duty is going to sell 700,000 copies or something like that. I mean, it's going to sell 10 million or 15 million copies. But nonetheless, I do get concerned about that. And I've just learned to let go. And kind of, I've been trying to kind of mentally plan out my approach. Like, I want to get through Tomb Raider. I'm going to Platinum Spider-Man. I got to get back and really Platinum Guacamelee. I want to beat Chasm. I haven't beaten Chasm yet. I want to spend more time with Dead Cells. So I've already let go of Call of Duty, which I'm obviously not going to play. I'm not playing Battlefield. Mm. Assassin's Creed, maybe. Yes, maybe no. And so the only other two games post Tomb Raider that I know I'm going to play that are new is Red Dead and Fallout. And then hopefully December will just be a game, a, a month of catching up. And then before you know it, Animush is coming in hot and all this other shit. So it's crazy. It's a job. And I still have to fucking. I want to beat Dragon Quest, you know. It's which is yeah, good which luck is, with that. Which is a full time job. Yeah. So yeah, good luck indeed. Number eight. Sekiro: Shadows Die Twice is one of the most anticipated games of 2019, but developer from Software, the minds behind Dark Souls and Bloodborne, originally began working on the game under the assumption that it would be a Tenchu title. 
a dormant ninja-themed IP that began on the original PlayStation, an IP that From Software happens to own. In a conversation with Games Industry International, Yasuhiro Katao, From Software's community manager, told the website, quote, When we originally set out to create something different from Dark Souls and our previous titles, we thought it would be interesting to make a Japanese-themed game. So from that, we started going in the direction of the Shinobi and Ninja, and of course, Tenchu is an IP with that history. That was the original impetus for this project. But as we developed and as we partnered with Activision and started building it together, it started becoming its own thing, and the game we wanted to make was no longer just Tenchu, so it really evolved into its own thing, end quote. The original Tenchu, Stealth Assassins, came to PS1 in February of 1998, and Shadow Assassins, the latest installment, came to Wii and PSP in 2009. Interestingly, Sony originally owned Tenchu, which was then sold to Activision, and then in turn sold to From Software itself in 2004, meaning the entire Sekiro Activision arc is a little weird. Sekiro Shadows Die Twice is set to launch on March 22nd, 2019. I'm excited about that game. No, I'm pretty happy. That was one of the first things I thought when I saw it, too. I was like, this looks like Tenchu. This is awesome. I didn't realize that From owned it. I, I didn't know that either. I went and read about it. The sale happened a long time ago. I always thought that that Activision still owned that IP, but they don't. They don't. So it is interesting that Activision came to them with an IP they used to own, trying to get them to make a Tenchu game and, or something, and then they made it into something else. Pretty interesting story. Yeah, that's no, cool. Number nine, PlayStation 2 is officially dead in Sony's eyes. Oh, no. According to Kotaku, which translated some Japanese websites, Sony in Japan has discontinued service options for the console in its home country as of the end of August, meaning that people can no longer send the console into Sony to get it fixed if it's broken. Sony ceased manufacturing PS2 consoles in 2012, so it's been six years since a new one has been made, but those looking for official fixes in the East are officially out of luck. thought that was an interesting story. People are still sending things in. And what the story said, Chris, was that as of August 31st, you can like submit a claim and then still like send your PS2 in by September 7th. And after that, you're on your own. I'm surprised that this wasn't already the case. Me too. But it's nice that it wasn't. Yeah. Yeah. Number 10. La Mulana 2, and this is a wrap-up, by the way. Mm. La Mulana 2, the sequel to Metroidvania La Mulana, is set to come to PS4 in the spring of 2019. Looks really great. 2D side-scroller Nefarious is coming to PS4 next week on September 11th. Intriguing open-world horror game The Forest comes to PS4 on November 6th. Game looks really, really cool, by the way. You guys should go check out the PlayStation blog post about it. And we've been seeing that game float around for a while, but it looks great. Space Shooter Rebel Galaxy is getting a follow-up prequel set to launch in 2019 on PS4 and other platforms called Rebel Galaxy Outlaw. And finally, very important news, Shovel Knight's long-awaited final piece of DLC, King of Cards, will launch on April 9th, 2019. Super stoked about that. Shovel Knight rules. Yeah, Shovel Knight's been trucking along for a while. Yeah, they're, you know, those guys are in Marina Del Rey, right near where I live. I went and saw them in December because I wrote the foreword to their art book and I got it signed for my nephew for Christmas. Oh, that's awesome. And they weren't willing to show me anything, which I totally understand. I actually had to sign an NDA just to get into the studio. And I, I kept asking them, I'm like, where is this? Just make the sequel already. And they were like, we're still fulfilling our Kickstarter goal, like our Kickstarter promises with the DLC. I was like, I respect that. Yeah, that's good. So I'm really excited for the next big thing. But the cool thing about these DLC packs is that they're really new games. Like, you know, the Spectre Knight one is really, really fun. So go check them out. If you haven't played Shovel Knight, I highly recommend it. It's time to get into the new game releases, Chris. And we got a letter about this. Tony Carney says, hey, gentlemen, I have been enjoying my Tuesday drives to work. Thanks to you. So thanks for making an honest and informative podcast. I have a suggestion that may make reading the list of new PS1 releases easier for Chris to take. Accents. Pick a random (laughs) accent for each reviewer for the week and read them that way. Informative and amusing, even if some of the accents aren't 100% accurate. I'm going to do you one better because Chris and I talked about this last week. Chris, I'm going to let you take this one away. All right. And you're going to read the descriptions for these. There's not 26 this week, but it looks like there's probably like 15. There's a decent amount still. That's still a lot, really. It's too much. Yeah. It's too much, but there are a few releases worth noting this week, so... Let's get into it, and uh, you can start with 428. I'm interested to see what you think of these descriptions. Unedited. <laughs> are we gonna be Are we gonna be alternating? If, if that's like what you like, one, one, one is that one. what you'd like? Yeah, I think okay. Be let's fun. do that. All right, be a fun little game. All right, all right you kick off right. then. 428 Shibuya Scramble PS4 and digital. A kidnapping in Shibuya brings together a detective, a journalist, a former gang leader, a big pharma researcher, and a part timer. Stuck in a cat costume for a series of unexpected events. Can they, or the city itself, make it through the day? A part timer? What? Part time? What? <laughs> that's a mis- That's the biggest mystery of all in 428 Shibuya Scramble. A part timer. Shibuya, great place to stay in Tokyo, by the way. If you guys ever go, Apocalypse Rider comes to PSVR. Apocalypse Rider is a VR arcade motorcycle game where you must prevail the high speed wasteland roads, avoid the hostile traffic, and keep surviving, speeding. And riding. And by the way, riding is in all capital letters for no reason. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's... <laughs> Jesus. 
Arcade Islands Volume 1, coming to PS4. Collect treasure as you master 33 games on six exotic islands in your, in your quest to be crowned ruler of the islands. Play solo or with friends via local co-op or, and competitive play. <sighs> I'd rather not. Yeah. Destiny 2 Forsaken comes to PS4, also available at retail. The Reef has fallen to lawlessness, and now the most wanted criminals in the galaxy have organized a jailbreak at the Prison of Elders. You and C Cade 6, is that you said? Yeah. Have been sent in to bring law and order back to the embattled facility. But things do not go to plan. Ooh. And by the way, Chris, this reminds me, before we go any further mm -hmm. with this, I did want to ask you this. We did get a question. Where is it? Here it is. Wesley wrote in to us and said, Hi, Chris and Colin. Love the show. Keep up the good work. Chris, the question is directed to you. Mm -hmm. In Destiny, do you have a favorite raid? Vault of Glass and King's Fall blew my world as a console gamer. Vault of Glass was a lot of fun. That was like the first time. This is the first raid I've ever done because I don't really do like uh, the MMO thing. You know? So I thought. I don't was, blame uh, you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it's, it's too much. But like NFPS made it a little bit more appealing to me. And uh, no, it was a lot of fun. Dimension Drive coming to PS4. This intense space shoot 'em up challenges you to fight across two battlefields on one split screen. Master advanced techniques like the drift drive to dodge bullets in a flash, or even flip to reverse drive to hit enemies when they least expect it. I'm a hard pass on that one. Dragon Quest XI: Echoes of an Elusive Age comes to PS4, and re uh, it's also available at retail. Dragon Quest XI Echoes of an Elusive Age follows the perilous journey of a hunted hero who must uncover the mystery of his fate with the help of his charismatic companions. Highly recommended for JRPG fans. Not recommended at all for Chris. <laughs> are they Are they charismatic companions? They are. A little over the top, in fact. Good. That's actually better, I think. Full Blast comes to PS4 and Vita with an art style inspired by the 80s and the 90s. <laughs> <laughs> Full Blast is a vertical scrolling shooter that will uh, bring a dose of nostalgia to all gamers who spent many an hour at their local arcade engaging in shumps. Shmups. Oh, shmups. <laughs> <laughs> I'm also dyslexic, so whoops. <laughs> Immortal Unchained comes to PS4. This is released on the 7th, so that is what a Friday release, I want to say. I think. Yes. Unleashed and Unforgiving. Can you rise to the challenge? Take the role of a living weapon, unleashed to stop the source of a cataclysmic event threatening to end all worlds. It's very vague. Yeah. Marvel Spider-Man coming to PS4 and retail uh, on September 7th. Uh, the worlds of Peter Parker and Spider-Man collide in an original action-packed story. In this new Spider-Man universe, iconic characters from Peter and Spider-Man's lives have been reimagined, placing familiar characters in unique roles. I don't like how they use characters twice in the same sentence. That bothers me. Yeah, it's also not a very good like description. No, it's a terrible description, but they don't need it. Yeah, I guess they One don't. of the few games that doesn't need it. They really could have just been like, hey, Spider-Man. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Spidey. Moonfall Ultimate comes to PS4. Moonfall Ultimate is a 2D side-scrolling action RPG set in an industrial gothic universe. Hack, slash, and cast your way through a treacherous hand-painted world in solo, couch co-op, or endless arcade mode. I like gothic. I like that style. I think Me that's too. why I like Bloodborne so much. Yeah, Bloodborne was beautiful. Just yeah. gorgeous. NASCAR Heat 3, coming to PS4 and retail on September 7th. There are more ways to race than ever before in NASCAR Heat 3, including a newly, the newly expanded career mode and new esports tournaments. Plus, all your favorite modes are back and better than ever. You a fan of the Heat series? No. Ah. I don't even have a license. Oh, so. oh yeah. <laughs> it be difficult for me to drive at a NASCAR. Put me on the NASCAR track and I'll, I'll be done. I'll be I dead. forgot that. NBA Live 19, the one edition, comes to PS4. It's a Friday release. Show off your signature style on courts around the world as you earn the respect of NBA stars, legends, and icons who join your squad on your journey to be the one in the league and the streets. Hmm. The streets and the sheets, perhaps. Yeah, and those are all capitalized. So cool. Ninjin Clash of Carrots comes to PS4. Uh, Ninjin Clash of Carrots is an anime-inspired beat-em-up with a gaggle of varied enemies, deep customization, uh, ellipses, and ninjas. Play through side-scrolling worlds consisting of multiple stages and uh, collect carrots stolen by the evil Shogun Mo. What? <sighs> Planet Alpha comes to PS4. Planet Alpha, a beautiful alien world filled with mystery and danger. Injured, stranded, and alone, you must harness the power of night and day as you struggle to survive while being pursued by relentless enemies. <laughs> Injured, stranded, and alone. I love that description. It's so apt. <laughs> it's like my life. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Shadows Awakening comes to PS4 and retail. 
Shadows Awakening is a unique, isometric, single-player RPG with real-time tactical combat. You take control of a demon summoned from the Shadow Realm to consume- Isn't that a Yu-Gi-Oh thing? <laughs> summoned from the Shadow Realm to consume the souls of long-dead heroes and embark on an epic adventure. I want you to take the next one, too. Siggy, a far from Melusina, comes to PS4 and Vita on September 7th. Uh, join Knight Siggy as he runs, jumps, and battles in a flatulent quest to save Mes Mel Melusina. God damn it, this fucking fake word. Mel yeah, Melusina? Melusina? Mel Mel Melusina? I don't know. All right, whatever. The love of his life. Take down hordes of goofy enemies and crazy bosses and make your way to the top of Mount Stinkup. <laughs> Good lord. SNK Heroines Tag Team Frenzy comes to PS4 on the 7th. Grab a friend and enter the SNK Dream Match in this frenetic fighting party game featuring SNK's iconic heroines in the brand new 2 vs. 2 fighting game. Zone of the Enders, the second runner, comes to PSVR and retail. Zone of the Enders, the second runner. What? what it's is Mars that? Remastered, but the A is upside Whoa. down. Whoa. <laughs> that that's a horrible thing to do to somebody with <laughs> dyslexia. <Yeah. laughs> the A is literally upside down as it's written. So here. it looks right for you. <laughs> <laughs> Zone of the Enders, the second runner, Mars Remastered, and... In uh, 4K and full VR, enter orbital frame Jehudi's cockpit and fly through Martian skies. Do you, have you ever played Zoe before? A long time, like to the point where I barely remember anything. I just know what Jehudi is. Yeah, Zoe. I never played the second one. Zoe, the original Zone of the Enders. For people that don't know, this was a Kojima game. Yeah. And Kojima made two Zone of the Enders games. There was also a Zone of the Enders Fist of Mars, which was like a tactical RPG that was on GBA. That I actually remember very well because I played it on my GBA when I was at my co my high school graduation, like in the we were like sitting there and they're going through the speeches and I was just playing that game. Yeah, I I I'm almost so positive that I had no idea what I was doing in that game when I first played it. It's a tough game. There was a guy named Mark Ryan who actually hired me at IGN who was obsessed with Zone of the Enders, loved it. <laughs> and there are just there are some people that really really love that series, and it's Konami's way of I guess you know tapping that that Kojima ness for just a little bit longer. Chris, that's all of the game releases we've gotten through the news. I've compiled a list of 10 or so questions from the audience to wrap things up this week. All right. So let's get into it. Let's do it. Brian Probin writes into us and says, Hi, Colin and Chris. Thanks for being the highlight of my week and for bringing Chris's videos into my life. Oh, thank you. With there being a recent trend in the industry of Metroidvanias, I'd be curious to hear what your thoughts are on the next, well, what the next trend is going to be. For sure, the Metroidvania genre is used to be a it used to be a nice treat when you get a good a good Metroidvania. And then in the last month or so, there have been maybe five or six great Metroidvania games released, like Hollow Knight, Dead Cells, Chasm, Guacamelee Two, yeah. lots of them. I mean, that would be a year's or a year and a half's worth of of great Metroidvanias a few years ago. And I'm actually a little concerned about it because I don't want people, I don't want to get tired of that genre, and I don't want people to get tired of it. You think we're gonna get to like too many? Yeah, I, well, yeah. and and they're can they're certainly cannibalizing each other. I mean, they oh have yeah, hundred percent. So, and I feel bad because I know some of the people that have made some of these games, and I'm sure that they wish that they weren't released coincidentally around all these other ones. But what do you think will be the next like genre trend or whatever? I know we see battle royale developing, but do you see anything developing beyond that? I think I don't think the shared world shooter thing is anywhere near over. Or the shared world type of... Th I think we're going to see a lot of like single-player games try to experiment with like blending multiplayer in. I think even Doom is doing a little bit a little bit of that with uh, the invasion mode that they have where you can like join people's campaigns. I think that's probably going to be a thing uh, more so than it already is. Especially because it's just cool and I, I like it and I want it to be a thing. So that's I'm going to will this trend into existence because I want more of that. Use your prestige and power on this show, Sacred Symbols. Well, listen, I've willed grappling hooks into several games just to, just from sheerly uh, preaching the good word. Because apparently, I don't know if you saw over the weekend, they're putting a, they're putting a grappling hook in Fortnite now. I saw that. Now I you're was like Fortnite laughing. No, no, nah, nah, I'm not going to play it. I'm, I'm, I'm still sick of seeing it. I saw the picture you put up outside your hotel room or whatever of the Fortnite tent. Yeah. I couldn't you can't escape it it's insane did we tell the story about when we were walking to the diner one day and there was like this little kid with his mom and we were just all we heard like we were walking and all we heard him say was Fortnite. Like, yeah like he was he, he was saying more things but like it was just like gibberish up until a little bit like Fortnite was just like and it was right after we were talking about how we couldn't escape people talking about Fortnite. that was that was a funny it moment. was a pretty funny moment marcel wrote into us and said i'll be doing a six-month internship at ign germany which I'm really excited about. I'm excited to write about video games because I have a deep passion for both writing and games, but also because this is what I'd like to do after I got my degree. Yet I'm also a little bit afraid whether or not I actually made the right choice after I've heard what you and a few of your colleagues, meaning video game journalists, and he says that in quotes, I like that, have, have been saying recently about games media and the possible demise thereof. Hence, I fear that I'm maybe hopping onto a sinking ship and chasing a rabbit that has actually already been dead from the beginning. To phrase it in a more general manner, would you recommend entering the video games media journalism industry? And it's 
and it's entailing career path to a young dude like me nowadays. I'm 26, by the way. What are your thoughts on this, guys? I think this is more of a more of a you thing. I'll be interested to hear what you have to say after I say what I have to say. Sure. Which is, if you didn't have that internship at IGN, I would absolutely say that you shouldn't do this. And the reason I say that is because it's not only incredibly competitive still, and there's lots of freelancers that are just floating around trying to get any scraps that they can, but full-time jobs at these at these places are, are shrinking. The you know, staffs of these places are shrinking and the sites that are going to survive like IG and GameSpot, Kotaku and stuff are, are already well stocked. I just think with YouTube and Twitch and podcasting, just eating these places lunch, just absolutely slowly destroying them that for most people, I would highly recommend you don't go in that direction. And that if you wanted to do video games or write about video games or really better yet, make videos about them or podcasts about them, that you do it independently. Now I have some advice for you though, Marcel, Take advantage of this opportunity. Make a name for yourself in that German you know, gaming sphere and elsewhere if you want. There are plenty of European YouTubers and Twitch streamers that are huge around the world. You don't have to speak English for that. You obviously know English, but what I'm saying is if you want to do German press, you're going to limit yourself to the German public. But take advantage of this. Make a name for yourself. And then if things don't work out, you might be able to spin off and do something smaller by yourself on, on your own like I've done and like others have done as well. But I do think that for most people, the honest truth is that it is absolutely a dead end and there's just way too much competition out there and you have a better chance of making a name for yourself on Twitch or YouTube or podcasts. What do you think of that? I think it's good to be a part of something. I think it's good to have like uh, your name, a part of this company that I don't think IGN is really going anywhere. I think IGN oh. has a pretty solid, you know, I, th I think it's a pretty solid place to be. It, I, I would say this, if you're doing this kind of work, you should feel good that you're there, you know, as opposed to like, I don't know. <laughs> what's another one? GameSpot. Uh, no, game even, spot, even worse. Games radar. Oh my, yeah, exactly. Like it's, no it's better to off these places, by the way. But. Yeah, no, but it's 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 better off that you're in something that has a, a pretty well established, um, you know, force in the in the industry. But yeah, I don't know. I think, I mean, YouTube is also super competitive. Sure. Like it's it's not. There's really no correct way to go about it. You just have to be incredibly not lazy. You have right. to you have to really like work a lot. Uh, absolutely. And uh, as absolutely. long as you're willing to do that, you'll you'll do fine. Again. You're in a unique position because you have the advantage of being at IGN and just work hard, make a name for yourself, save your money. And I don't mean that in a facetious way. If this is, you're 26 years old and if you run into a dead end or a wall in a few years or whatever, you're going to want to be able to pivot in some way and you're going to need money to do that. So that's my advice to you. Blake East writes in and says, do either of you have a preferred or favorite fighting game? Chris mentioned the PS1 being his favorite console, mm -hmm. and it reminded me of my fond memories I had with Tekken 3 back in the day. Chris, what fighting games do you enjoy? Well, I, I mean, I've talked a little bit about, like, the, the original Budokai, the Dragon Ball games that were on PS2. I really love those. Tekken 2, for me, was, like, a, a really big one. I really love Tekken 2. One that's, like, really underrated that nobody talks about is Bloody Roar. Bloody Roar 2 is, like, so good. And, like, that entire franchise is so weird to me. Uh, did you ever play Bloody War at all? Do you know what it is? Yeah, yeah, the an it's when the animals. It's like the one where you like transform into animals. Yep. You could just do ridiculous. You could kick people through the barriers of the of the ring, and it was like you. It's, it's ridiculous, and the sound the sound design in that game was so good. Like Bloody Roar Two, I think is my favorite fighting game, as as obscure as it is to people nowadays, because uh, it's just so weak. There's a mummy that turns into a giant mosquito. Like this is awesome. We need more of it. It's an interesting choice. Yeah, I don't think I've ever actually played Bloody Roar. It's good. I might have, but maybe it's good. It was, maybe the, I rented it's it like day. really f surprisingly fluid for how old it is. I'm going to go with some Capcom fighters personally. Mm -hmm. Street Fighter 2 and Street Fighter 2 Turbo and Super Street Fighter 2 were seminal games of my childhood, my youth. And I have to give a shout out to those. Street Fighter Alpha 3 is probably my favorite Street Fighter game. That was a PS1 game, a late PS1 game that I really, really enjoyed a lot. And then in terms of 3D fighters, I have to give a shout out to Power Stone on Dreamcast, which I absolutely adored. I loved that game when I had my Dreamcast back in the day. And Soul Cal and Soul Cal 2, yeah. especially Soul Calibur 2 on GameCube, particularly. Yeah. No, really, Soul really Calibur is great. great. Yeah. And Soul Calibur 6 right around the corner. Yeah. Irk Prime says, will there ever be a time you stop playing video games? Can you picture yourself as 80-year-old gamers with a handheld or console in your old people residence playing games with old bags, other old bags of bones? <laughs> This is a really interesting question because yeah. we have not. I've thought about this a lot about yeah. like where I would be like 60. Like if if like retirement homes in 80 or like 60 years are going to have like playstations and stuff in them because like very clearly we're a generation of people who are, are very knowledgeable about that kind of thing or have a lot of experience with it. I don't foresee a time where I'm going to stop playing games, but I do foresee a stop a, a time where I'm probably going to just, you know, wither away and just kind of play the things that I know I like again. 
You know, it's like, hey, this is my uh, third run through of Crash Three or something. You know, fit like my fifty nine millionth playthrough when I'm like old and in like a beanbag chair. <laughs> <laughs> I love beanbag chairs. I'm fond yeah. of those. No, they're great. I don't know that I'll ever stop playing games either. I ebb and flow. I, I've talked to people before. Like my sophomore year of college, I didn't play video games almost at all. Mm-hmm. That was the year that you know San Andreas came out, and what else came out? San Andreas came out and Resident Evil 4. And I made exceptions for those games when they came out. That I think one came out the fall of 2004, the other came out the spring of 2005, and I played those games. But otherwise, I was just busy with school. I was, you know, I had a girlfriend and, you know, was partying and doing college things. So I was very comfortable not really playing games at that time. And even at IGN, there was like probably a few three or four month periods where if I wasn't playing something for work, I just wasn't playing video games at all. You need yeah. to take breaks from that, but I don't think I'll ever take a permanent break. Yeah, yeah. I I, I just think when I'm not playing games, it's really it, what it really means is I'm playing old games right. that I know I love. And like, I love the way you put it, Chris. I think yeah. you're absolutely right about that time will come when you just embrace what already exists. Yeah. And the fun thing is, is that, you know, if we're 70 or 80 years old, the, the back catalog of games that you never played too that already exist will be expansive as well. I'm totally convinced that if I never played another new game for the rest of my life, that I would have plenty of games to play still for, oh, yeah. forever. So, yeah, I, I'll be really interested to see how this develops because I don't really count the Coleco and Atari generations as real gaming generations. Those were novelty games yeah, that yeah. were not really deep. Gaming really started on PC and NES in the early and mid 80s. And so I'll be interested to see what happens with that generation and onward if those old folks are playing games in the future. And I know that in this audience, and I've, I've met them and talked to them in the past, we have a lot of retirees now that are playing video games in this audience. Uh, there's a retired police officer that is, that's a fan of mine that picked up games only when he retired, Yeah, which is amazing. And, no, and, he, and he loves open world role playing games and shooters and shit. And I'm like, I've tried in my own family to get some of my older family members. My, my uncle's retired, for instance. And I've tried multiple times. I'm like, you should really consider playing a video game you might he he's told it's totally alien to him yeah no, and it's I crazy do, and i do not think that he understands what they are i yeah. think they think about mario <laughs> there's like a fundamental like i guess we t- kind of take for granted how familiar we are with operating in a in a virtual space that isn't real when i was like a kid i tried to get my dad to play medal of honor rising sun oh that's a good one yeah it's a, it's a great one and uh he kept looking at the sky and just kind of staring at the sky and not knowing like what he was looking at because in his mind he didn't think of it as the sky. It's 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 crazy like the stuff that we we just kind of take for granted that we know and understand. Absolutely, I think once you get over that and once you know I'm I'm experiencing it with my own girlfriend with Aaron who didn't care at all about video games until we started dating and and slowly came around to them and, and enjoys them now. And she played Detroit front of, and by herself like while I was sleeping, right. which I so I love that kind of stuff, but. She can't play action games like 3D games. She does not understand sticks and doesn't yeah. understand how to work them in real time. And I think that once she gets over that hurdle, it opens up a whole new, you know, a whole new array of games for her to play. I'm so. excited for old people in like <laughs> in shared hospital rooms, like reminiscing about Doom. Yeah, it's going to be awesome. There it is. Your Doom reference. Nicholas Gouveia wrote into us, said, hi, Colin and Chris. Do you think PlayStation remaining a Sony subsidiary is restricting the potential of the PlayStation brand? We know that the PlayStation console has helped Sony's financial results in recent years. However, do you think the outlook for PlayStation would be best suited if they were to go it alone and have more freedom to take risks? Considering PSVR is probably a better bet for Sony rather than for the gaming console, could this be a case where efforts are wasted for the benefit of the conglomerate? This is an interesting question to me, Chris, because there was some chatter that PlayStation was going to spin off. That was a while ago, years ago. And Sony has enjoyed playstation's company and been hurt by playstation because he says here that playstation 4 particularly has really helped sony's bottom line but playstation 3 destroyed sony's bottom line back in the mid to late you know aughts as it were right it's similar with microsoft with xbox being in a in a situation where you can borrow technologies and integrate technologies and get help and you know like psvr will work with tvs i'm sort of sony tv soon and all that kind of stuff i think that's just advantageous to to you know make, get the brand out there Making a video game console is not cheap, and making a video game console and marketing it and getting it out there requires an incredible amount of capital, incredible amount of know-how, and I don't think you necessarily would want to sever yourself from all of those tethers and connections that enhance the ecosystem. So I I personally think that PlayStation is well-served under the Sony umbrella, and I think Sony, clearly, as he said, is well-served by PlayStation because, you know, PS4 has contributed a great deal to Sony's success. Yeah, no, I think you said that perfectly. I wholeheartedly agree. Amir Rosenberg wrote into us and said, hi, hi, dudes. Greetings from Israel. I have a very simple question to ask you guys. 
Do you think that there's any chance that Neil and the rest of the team at Naughty Dog can match the crazy expectations of the sequel? He's talking about The Last of Us Part 2. I'm on the skeptical side, but I'd love to hear what you think. So please make Tuesdays great again. Too late. We already have. Chris. Yeah. Do you think, and I know you're not a Last of Us fan or a big Last of Us fan like me. So I, this is why I'm more curious about your perspective. Mm-hmm. Do you think that this game could possibly be any better than the original Last of Us? Because for many gamers, not you included, many gamers consider that arguably the best PlayStation 4 or best PlayStation exclusive in the history of the brand. Mm -hmm. Do you think that they can even possibly deliver something that will meet expectations? I don't think so. I I think the hype is a bit too high. And I think this this is something that kind of consumes a lot of games where like you kind of come out of nowhere with a a surprise success and then you have to follow that up and it, it very rarely it rarely matches i think i i think the last of us 2 is going to be a good game i think it's going to be well made and i think it's going to be enjoyed by the majority of people who play it but i don't th- hype is just too high for games in general honestly now and i think uh it's i think it's going to disappoint people because it's just not going to be the first time they're going to experience a game like that right right you know the gameplay we saw at E3 during the very indulgent and ill-timed and ill-conceived press conference that they yeah. did. It looks amazing. It looked like a step up. Like, it didn't look like more Last of Us to me. It looked no, way, no. way more interesting in a sense. Yeah, it looked way more dynamic to me. It looked very, very impressive. And I think that's probably going to impress people. But I don't know if they can really match the... I don't know if they can match the heart of the first one. Like, even I, like as like not a big fan of like the gameplay i did like the story and i thought like it was very compelling it's gonna be tricky to match that surprise success i think the same for god of war also the next god of war has a huge uh huge shoes to fill yeah absolutely and they're obviously obviously god of war will get a sequel i think this is the end of the road for the last of us after this game regardless of how it does yeah. i don't think they even really want to make a sequel to begin with the idea of having a self-encapsulated game i think is quite quite novel and quite intriguing i would love for a company to just be like we're not making another one i don't care how good or how much you want it like we're we yeah. have we've said all we've needed to say that's the is thing a smart business too. no but. that's the thing for me too like i thought the last of us was very good as a standalone i was kind of irritated to see a sequel although it does look really good like when it was first announced i was like why why are you doing that why why that black guy who says he's no relation to some black guy and presumably <laughs> also no relation to my buddy who's ask a black dude says question for chris hey mr raygun hey hey i know you're a fanatic of the grappling hook have you played bionic commando rearmed or the 2009 game simply called bionic commando those games have given me a appreciation for grappling hook focused games and made me wish for more but unfortunately bionic commando rearmed 2 wasn't as good and besides flint hook there's not a notable there's a notable dearth of them thanks that black guy i did play the um the original the, or that remake of uh, bionic commando in 09 and i actually really uh that that is a middle market game and that is not a game that is particularly great at all, but that game had a multiplayer mode that was inc- that was so much fun to me because I don't know if you ever played that game. No, I didn't no. play Bionic Command. I didn't they, play they, any Bionic Commandos. That game since the NES. was buried. Like they did not market that game at all. That game ha- was sent out to die, and uh, it sucks because while it wasn't like particularly great or like perfect, there was an interesting bedrock of gameplay there uh, that really could have uh, could have been I don't know built upon. The multiplayer mode in that game was so good. It was just it was just Spider-Man with guns. And it was awesome. Wasn't there a controversy around one of those Bionic Commando games with a woman who lost her arm or Uh-oh. something like that in a real life? There's some like weird I have thing no idea. itching me in the brain where there was like some controversy around Bionic Commando and some real life amputee that might be famous for some reason. I- I, I don't. This sounds like familiar to me, yeah, but I also I can't at all pinpoint. I could be making that up completely. People can write in and tell us. I'm sure they will. <laughs> but yes, I did play that game and I enjoyed it quite a bit. Nawaz Qureshi, not to be confused with Quarashi, the mm-hmm. Icelandic rap rock band, said, okay. Hi, Colin and Chris. I've been thinking about the success of Horizon Zero Dawn and how it blew everyone away as nobody expected that game from an FPS developer, Guerrilla Games. My question is, what other studios do you think should step outside their comfort zone and do something completely new? For example, I think Treyarch can make an excellent survival horror game if Activision allowed them to do so. Newsflash, Activision ain't letting any of those studios make anything but Call of Duty. Or at least anytime soon. Sledgehammer, Treyarch, Infinity Ward, Raven. Don't expect any new games from them. Absolutely. What do you think? I would love, and I love that he brought up Gorilla because it's true. We didn't expect that they were going to be able to do what they did. And I remember sitting down in E3 playing Horizon for the first time before it came out. And 
I was like, this is incredible. Yeah. I had no idea you can do this. And I'm not insulting them. They made first-person shooters. That's all they made. For people that don't know, Guerrilla Games was founded in the early 2000s. Their first game was called NAM 76 or NAM 74 or something. So some first-person shooter. Then they made Killzone. Then they made Killzone 2. And I think Sony bought them at that time. And so all they made were Killzone games. And there's nothing wrong with that. They're engineered to make first per- linear first-person shooters, multiplayer shooters. Yeah, they're good at it. So. And they segued to making open-world third-person role-playing games. And... We kind of knew they were going to do that because of the hiring they were doing. They hired New Vegas's writer and all that kind of stuff. That was when the jig was up, when we were like, all right, something's going on over there. And so we also were seeing that more recently with, with CD Projekt and Cyberpunk. They did a kind of an opposite move. They made third-person open-world role-playing games, and now they're making a first-person open-world sh- FPS RPG. Yeah. And it's exciting and dynamic, and I think studios enjoy that. Some studios don't. You hear a lot of stories about people quitting studios when they make new games. And I'm sure Guerrilla lost some of their talent when they made Horizon, and I'm sure CD Projekt lost some of their talent when they were making Cyberpunk. But that's kind of a risk worth taking. So for me, I would love to see a studio like in the first party do something totally dynamic. Sucker Punch, for instance, makes third-person open-world action games. I would love to see them make a shooter. I would love to see Polyphony Digital make an action game. I would love to see, you know, but again... You have to... Polyphony Digital is made to make racing games. Sucker Punch is made to make open world games. And I think that the themes that we're seeing with some of the studios changing changing their direction is not common. And so I think we can wish for these things, but I don't know that we'll get them. Does anything resonate with you? I want Bungie to do something. Because Bungie's you're... had a, just a huge history with shooters in general. Mm. Like, they've made, they made Marathon. They made... Like every single game they've made, aside from, like, maybe their Pong clone when they were first making games, has been a shooter. They had Marathon. They had... Obviously, Halo and now Destiny. And they found success with, like, all of them. So it's like, they're good at it, and they know how to do it. But, like, I, I think they could, I think they can make a really good third-person action game. Or, like, any, anything. Just try something. Because I think there's a lot of talent there. I, I know it's, like, not the same Bungie that uh, it was prior to the Activision uh, uh, acquisition. But I think it'd be cool to see them step out of their comfort zone a little bit. Well, it's important to note, and I th- I think that, because Bungie's an intriguing thing too, Bungie's deal, as far as I understand with Activision, is not an ownership stake, but no. just a publishing deal. So they can get away from them, and I think that they might. I don't know what the nature of the deal is. They might have a three-game deal with them or something. It would be cool to see, and again, because Insomniac, Bungie, and just a few others are from software, there's not that many massive AAA totally independent freelance studios. Yeah. And so to, they can actually take the risk and they can certainly solicit the funds to do it. And we'll see if that happens. I, I have a feeling we're not going to see Destiny 3. So I'll be interested to see what they do as well. Yeah. We have only a few more questions here. Four of them. Okay. Ryan Rouse wrote in and said, hello, Colin and Chris. Love the show. Thank you, Ryan. Thanks for making Fridays, now Tuesdays as a recent Patreon supporter. Great again. You're very welcome. My question to you is your thoughts on the state of Bioshock. I remember hearing years ago that the franchise still had games planned after Ken Levine stepped away. Now, after many years of silence, I'm not so sure, and it saddens me. Do you think the series is gone forever, or could there be more? What other game franchises would you like to be revived? As far as I understand, Bioshock 3, or a third mainline, it's really technically the fourth Bioshock game, is in development at one of 2K's subsidiaries in Northern California. That's what I I have heard. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's true. I think you can read about that, that other people have talked about that as well. I think... I, I could be wrong. There's a studio in Novato, north of San Francisco, that I think was made up of the guys that did, like, Hangar 13, the guys that did Mafia 3 and some others. I think that that game's been percolating for a while over there. I don't think Bioshock's dead. You're never going to see Ken Levine do another Bioshock game. But I've always been of the mind that Bioshock 2, which was not a Levine game, was a great game. I don't think that you necessarily... I love Ken Levine. I know him, and we talk sometimes, so I'm not trying to, like, blow smoke up his ass. He's a really nice guy, really talented, creative guy. I'm not saying that, but I do believe Bioshock 2 is almost as good as Bioshock and Bioshock Infinite. I don't think that it's like that much of a step down like people made it out to be. Mm -hmm. So I think you can get a really effective Bioshock game from another team, and I don't think you've seen the last of that franchise, and I think that would be suicidal for 2K to avoid uh, doing that. So what do you think? Do you think we've seen the last of Bioshock? I know you are also a fan. I'm a huge fan of it. I kind of disagree. I didn't like Bioshock 2 at all. Really? What didn't (laughs) you like about it? I think I didn't like the perspective shift. I didn't really care being that... Ca- that character that slow tankish character and i know it probably changes throughout the game but like I, it didn't grab me as much probably because and i think a lot of this is why bioshock and bioshock infinite were so successful and so uh you know revered is because 
in my mind, Bioshock is about kind of putting you in a very odd situation that you have no that you have kind of no bearing on or you have no really no real context for until you dive into it. So Bioshock 2 taking place in the same place as Bioshock 1 kind of almost robbed it of its surprise to me. You know, because the first one was like shocking. No pun intended. Yeah. But and, and yeah. the, they were both like very unique twists. And I, I don't think you need to see I don't think you need to see more of Columbia or like more of Rapture. I, I would prefer to see something kind of different right uh, from Bioshock and it just didn't I don't know it just didn't grab me as much but yeah I'm sure I'm sure they're making another one I don't know if I'm super interested in it until I see it but uh yeah I'll keep an eye on it I agree with you that going back to Rapture wasn't as cool the second time around it was cool to see it in an even worse shape than it was when you went there the first time in the first game yeah but I I don't think it's as good as the first of all very few games are as good as Bioshock the original Bioshock that's a top 10 game for right, me. Right. maybe even a top five game of all time Bioshock Infinite I finally beat for the first time early this year platinumed it on ps4 and loved it not as good as the original bioshock but great game way better than i thought it was yeah bioshock 2 not being on the same plane as those i'm simply speaking from the perspective of people really shitting on that game in a in a similar way oh, it wasn't terrible yeah yeah and it's it it's similar to, to to new vegas which people finally came around upon but just because bethesda game studios didn't make it everyone's like oh it's not as good and i'm like that game is better than fallout 3 yeah you know so i think that time has not been kind to bioshock 2 but i and i understand why people are upset about it but i i never i didn't really see it as this massive down downgrade from the original person right, right. that's fair jonathan Haffel says hey colin and chris my question is about gta 5 with the possibility of a new generation of consoles in the next couple of years what do you think the chances are rockstar would port gta 5 to the next generation do you think Rockstar would refrain from doing this to prevent cannibalizing GTA 6 sales or port over RDR 2 since it is the newer game? I would be interested to hear your thoughts. It's a great question. Do you think that we'll see a next gen, which would be now two generations away from the original, a next gen Grand Theft Auto 5? Or do you think we'll just see a GTA Online, GTA 6, whatever, on PS5? If they make a sequel, I don't think they'll port the. I don't, I don't think they'll port GTA 5 because I think it would cannibalize that game. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, I mean, it, it already is kind of risky putting out Red Dead to me. Like, that, seemed, that also seems like a weird thing to do while GTA V is still kind of, like, eating everything around it. It's, it's a weird... <laughs> GTA V is such a, a unique thing, like, especially how it's, like, just consumed the industry in the way that it has out of nowhere, that, like, it, it's really difficult to predict anything about it to me. Like, it's... it's What is this? Like, I don't get it. Force don't... to be reckoned with. Yeah, I don't get it. I, we talked about it a week or two ago, so I don't want to go too deeply into it, but I feel like a new Grand Theft Auto game, even being GTA 6 or having a single player component, is probably not going to happen. I, I would love for that to happen, but that's not how they made money on GTA 5. They made money on GTA 5 by investing in multiplayer, and that's why I'm so pleasantly surprised, that, and not pleasantly surprised, but happy that RDR2 is at least kind of true to the original in a lot of different ways. Mm-hmm. You can play it by yourself. I don't know, unfortunately... That we're gonna get another one of those really funny, really well written, really intriguing and compelling single player campaigns that we've gotten out of Rockstar in the Grand Theft Auto universe, and that's too bad. But you know, you got to follow the money. I don't blame them. And so I, I'm in agreement with you, Chris. I don't think that GTA Five will see the light of day beyond this generation. But I think you might see like some sort of GTA Online hybrid that's only the multiplayer component. I, I think they will do a single player part of it. I hope so. You know, I think GTA Five proved that it was a uh, it was worth a lot of people's money, specifically because I don't play GTA Five online at all. I own it, <laughs> but I don't play I don't play it online. And I think uh, the fact that they're doing Red Dead Two, despite the fact that they know already how much money they could make if it was just like an online thing, uh, I think it says a decent amount about what they're willing to do. I hope you're right. Yeah, because I was really turned off by this foray into multiplayer centric stuff with them, and th- like we said last week or two weeks ago that. GTA 4's DLC support with Ballad of Gay Tony and The Lost and the Damned were so awesome, and I wanted to see that. Those were arguably better and more interesting than the original game, and I, I was hoping we were going to get the same thing, but obviously they put their resources into moving away from that. Two more questions. Devastator3094 wrote in and said, Have you ever played an RPG that you felt the voice acting actually ruined the experience for you? I sometimes rather just read the scrolling text than suffer with terrible voice acting. I'm the same way, and I don't think he's only talking about JRPGs, so you can definitely ch- chime in on this, Chris. Mm-hmm. I read too quickly for the voices to even be useful to me, and I just usually X through them. I, I, I don't... And when I'm playing, like, generic games that are, like... Not generic games. That's not a way of putting it. When I'm playing a game with generic combat or, gener- like, I'm doing generic shit, like, running around a map and leveling up or doing quests, 
I listen to podcasts or music. I don't even listen to the audio on the game. So I've never had a game ruined for me or any voice acting that I thought was particularly. I, I guess Mass Effect Andromeda had a lot of bad voice acting, but that was like the least of its problems. <laughs> that was only like a, that was a small, small part of a bigger pie. A smidgen. No yeah. problem. Yeah, I still haven't played Andromeda. I do want to get to it at some point. You should. It's, I think I will. Uh, it's it's something. I'm convinced that it's not as bad as people are saying it is. It's de- well, at this point, it's kind of like the opposite of overhyped, where it's like you're gonna play it and you're gonna be like, this isn't terrible, and it's not terrible. It's just confusing. Right. That's yeah, too bad. Yeah. Final question. Alexander Dean says hello, good sirs. And I like this question. I want to end on this because I think it's thought provoking. So I know that next-gen games are already in development, but with the probable economic recession on the way, could you see the current console generation lifespan being artificially extended, much like the PS3 and Xbox 360 generation was? So for people that don't know, the only reason that PS3 and Xbox 360 were on the market for so long is because in the middle of the life cycle, actually towards the first third of the life cycle, the economy completely blew up and we almost went into a complete depression. So there was no way for them to even consider pushing these units out later. That's why when people talk within the times of console generations and that we're still happy with PS4, which I am. And everyone's like, it's only been, you know, five years or whatever. And I'm like, yeah, that's normal guys. I think that you're, you're looking at everything through the lens of the economic recession we went through where Xbox 360 wasn't replaced for eight years. That's never going to happen again. Right. But that's a whole generation that grew up with that specific time frame. Right. Right. You know, it's an interesting point of view though, Chris, because is it indicating to the console manufacturers who dump millions and tens of millions and hundreds of millions of dollars in the R and D and getting these consoles out that, they don't have to do that anymore, you know, or is it an indication that that really was a one off because the NES was 1985 to 1991 when the SNES came out. The SNES was out for five years before the N64 and 64 was five years before the GameCube. GameCube was five years before the Wii, you know, and so on and so forth. PS1 to PS2, five years. PS2 to PS3, six years. PS3 to PS4, seven and a half, eight years, really. So, yeah. well, really seven years. So, that's the outlier and the anomaly. I guess what I want to ask you, though, Chris, is do you feel like we... Do you even want a new console? I'm kind of perfectly happy with what I have. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy with... Uh, especially the upgrades. Like, the because I have the, the Xbox One X and the PS4 Pro, and they, they serve me entirely fine. Like, I don't think they're underpowered at all. I mean, I'm sure they're, like, actually underpowered when you compare it to, like, a you know, a beastly PC. But they, they, serve, its, they serve their purpose, and they run games relatively well and I, I don't really see a need to replace him yet that's why it kind of bugs me that uh, cd project red's thing with uh cyberpunk is a is is going to be a cross-generational thing or at least rumored to be because it just seems like why are you doing that like if you're gonna convince me to to buy a new thing you need to convince me that it can do things that my machine can't you know i'm not i'm not gonna buy a thing if, if my the thing that i have can already can do it, but like slightly worse. I want something that I that it can't do, you know. So I think that's gonna that's gonna be what determines whether or not this, whether or not I even jump on soon, or like early in the or as an early adopter. You know what I mean? Yeah, I think a lot of it's about timing, and also when you. I don't have technical knowledge at all, as a lot of people know. I don't. I don't understand it, <laughs> but. A lot of people are saying that like it's it's inconceivable to them how Sony and Microsoft can even manufacture new consoles that are much more powerful than this and make them affordable. And I don't I don't know if that's necessarily true, but a lot of people are saying like you're not going to be able to extract that much more out of these machines or out of consoles unless you want to charge way more for them. And people are saying like it's it's almost inconceivable that PS5 will be four hundred dollars, for instance, if if, if it's going to be like a big upgrade. And that's an interesting thing to keep in mind too. I guess is is even though these companies buy at such scale that they can get everything for way cheaper than normal manufacturers, still, they're not going to... The days of Sony charging, undercharging consoles to get them out in the wild and stuff, I think those days are gone. So, yeah. you know, and eating the cost to recoup on licensing fees and stuff, which is what they usually did. So, we'll see what happens. But, you know, I, I don't... I really do believe 2020 is the date. Oh, yeah. I, I think so, too. Do, but, do you th- but I think the question also was, like, do you think it's going to be a long generation? <sighs> I don't know. I, I can see a situation much like NES and SNES, much like PS3 and PS4, really, where there's significant overlay between those consoles. Mm-hmm. NES games, new NES games were coming out until 1994, published by Nintendo. That's three years after SNES came out. And they weren't like, these weren't like shitty games. Kirby, Mega Man 6, games like that. So, and with PS3, you know, we saw some cross-gen shit with Watch Dogs, which I think kind of ties into what we were talking about earlier with the downgrades and how those things are necessary sometimes. I'm really so intrigued because I don't feel the need for one of these 
but I also didn't feel like I needed PS4 until I played it. And, yeah, exactly. And then I was like, this is just using the UI. And now that I have PS4 Pro, man, like, the UI works again. It's so nice. Yeah, the, right? The, like, the PS4, vanilla PS4 UI is just so sluggish. Like, I have to restart my... I had to restart my PS4 all the time. And I have, I know it wasn't my PS4 because I have two of them, two vanilla PS4s, and both of them acted the same exact way. It was like the, the, the firmware is like almost... It's like what you always see with iPhone and Apple where Apple starts like sending shit to old iPhones to be like, no, nah, you should upgrade. Yeah, like, yeah, like nah. this, phone yeah exactly. this phone doesn't work anymore. <laughs> no, it's ridiculous. It's the same thing on the... the uh, because my friend has um, one of my roommates has the base Xbox One, and it it's hilarious. It's it, <laughs> it looks like a stop motion film. It's no no bueno. Have you been playing Modern Warfare Two? By the way, that's a big. Deal. I have. I have, I jumped into it again. It looks see this. <laughs> it looks awful <laughs> because I'm running it on a 4K TV, and that this is one of those games that has not had a, uh, an artificial up-res, like uh, unlike Red Dead Redemption, which like actually looks pretty good. But yeah, no, I'm playing it playing a little bit of multiplayer which is nice and uh nostalgic yeah yeah i heard i heard the voice chat is, is very familiar for a lot of people too yeah yeah <laughs> all the microphones sound awful and it's great uh, i'm stoked that that that's available for people for people that don't know modern warfare 2 was recently released for backwards compatibility on xbox one not an option on playstation 4 yeah it's a shame so maybe we'll get it on playstation now yeah Can't you can wait. stream you can stream a uh <laughs> an already old very not good looking game and it'll play even better and it'll look play, even better yeah, exactly well chris that's all i have pretty slow week for news and releases again next week we're gonna have a lot to talk about yeah chris yeah. will have played spider-man and hopefully beaten it by then we'll do again two different episodes they will roll out i think we're gonna record them the same day so episode 11 will roll out as usual and i think i'll probably stagger the spider-man release to maybe go a day or two later mm-hmm. so you guys can look forward to those again both of those will be available three days early ad free on patreon at patreon.com slash collins last stand otherwise keep an eye on the free feeds if you do listen to us on free feeds please consider giving us reviews scoring us nicely on itunes google play etc it helps us find new people and it helps us algorithmically and again thank you so much for listening to our show it's been fun watching the viewership or listenership i guess i should say grow and whether you're listening on podcast services, whether you're listening on Patreon, whether you're listening even on YouTube, where about fifteen or 20,000 people listen for some reason, we enjoy you and we appreciate you. So thank you so much. Absolutely. Chris, we'll see you next week. Did you hear that? What? You didn't hear that? What? Uh, I'm going crazy, man. What did you hear? I heard like a fucking thump. It's probably Lola. No, no. That was like coming from the other... That was weird. You think someone's in the wall? I'm sorry. I'm scatterbrained. I'm like a... I'm, I'm, I'm going, I think I'm going crazy. Maybe Honestly. you are. Yeah. I'll see you next week. Okay, bye. <laughs> Sacred Symbols, a PlayStation podcast, is fan supported over at patreon.com slash Collins Last Stand. The following names are at the producer level or higher on Patreon, and I want to thank you from the very bottom of my heart for your incredible kindness and generosity. Ahmed Alloways, Martin Beck, Fred Bentz, Michael Betts, David Blodel, Mark Boggio, Spencer Bran, Isaac Brewer, Lennon Brixey, Matthew Brousseau, Josh Bushing, Austin Bullock, Andrew Burkhart, Alex Cabrera, William Caldwell, Luis Cancado, Matthew Canoy, William O'Carroll, Shermer Carter, William Cashel, Brian Chand, Travis Chandler, Sean Chandler, Kenneth Char, David Chestnut, Steve Clifford, Dan Clifford, Chris Cochran, Simon Conception Jr., Brad Cooley, Nick Cummings, Daniel Diamore, Daniel Del Nicos, Travis Depew, Mitchell Durkash, David Ellis, Albert Escobar, Brian Fink, Joe Finelli, Eric Fickenbeiner, Connor Gashian, Alexander Gates, Michael Gates, Daniel Glassford, Nick Goblish, Tyler Goodwin, David S. Graham, Josh Gravelick, Ryan Greenwood, Miranda Grubba, Nick Gustafson, Andres Guzman, Tyler Harris, Wyatt Henry, Josh Yeager, Clarence Johnson, Paul Joyce, Greg Julefs, Jeremy Key, Kevin Komaki, Taylor C. Laudrin, Jackson Lasica, Donald Laws, Joe Lawson, Don Q. Lee, Patrick Leslie, Dustin Lewis, Keith A. Lewis, Chad Lewis, Mark Liberto, Lou and Ray Loper, Josh M., Ryan T. Mandel, John McManus, Joe McPartland, Albert Miranda, Patrick Malloy, Betty Ann Moore. Moriarty, A. Mukhtar, Brian Nietzsche, Connor Nesbitt, Josh Netzel, Adam Nix, Brian Ott, Jorge Palomino, Reed K. Parker, Todd Paxton, Brendan Peavy, Marius S. Peterson, Enrique Perez, Eric A. Peterson, Jason Pettit, Lawrence F. Prokop, Eric R. Pryor, Brandon Reed, Michael Renner, Peter Reynolds, Shane Rayum, Jonathan Rice, Austin Riley, Ramon Rodriguez Jr., Petro Rose, Michael Sanchez, Matthew Savoy, John Scholes, Chris Schaefer, Toby Schutman, German Sadu, Riley Smith, Jared Stuave, Alexander Suarez, Stephen Summingit, Ahmad Tamar, Tam Tran, Esteban Valentin, Oakley Waldron, Justin Wagaman, Tyler Woodall, Corey Wyatt, Tony Zuniga, Casual Misfits Gaming, Supershot ST, Madmock Media, Beric, Mubarak, Dav9834, Chris, and Donk2015.